Anna, you're all kinds of good crazy. Thank you. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Okay, we're 12 minutes past the top of the hour, and third time's a charm, it's the ladies' takeover! <laughs> for Hi. Which book are we doing? We are doing the t- Tangents of Heaven, or is it going to be the Fires of Tangents? I don't know. Tangents, tangents of, of heaven, heaven, I think. Yeah. I, I like Tangents of Heaven. Yeah. yeah. Also because we're heavenly. Because, uh-huh. duh. Yes. Also, it's the Accents edition of what's <laughs> around yes. the world edition yeah 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 and we have um all voices that were at spoiler con that's right yep. Fun. yep so uh yeah we should probably introduce ourselves because not everybody has our voices memorized from spoiler con rude so <laughs> what so are I you get... saying no one knows me <laughs> well we're about to fix that <laughs> offended um so i i guess i can go first and then we can work our way back west to to anna yeah fearless leader so yeah i am aradia you all know my voice way too well because i take up way too much airwaves and have my own podcast etc etc this is what i think my third tangents episode uh i love these ones because i don't have to actually know what happened i can just ramble about the book in its entirety and doesn't even matter (laughs) if i'm not kept up on the podcast sorry seth moving East, because I can do geography. I was not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, Kelsey, well, one of the Kelseys. I'm Canada Kelsey, or Kelsey name speaker in the Discord, I guess, for those who aren't super familiar with me and my Canadian shenanigans. I started listening to Watt Spoilers when they had just released like their 70th episode, I think. So I started listening and lurking for a very long time i binged through all the 70 episode with episodes within like maybe i don't know a couple weeks and then heard all about the discord in that time and they were just going to jordan con i think for the first time and that's kind of when i decided to join discord and here we mm. are on a tangents episode apparently <laughs> nin you're next <laughs> so i'm nin uh i'm also in canada right now my uh i'm in the blue and the green aja on the discord um my spoiler con claim to fame is that i asked michael kate redding and michael kramer what makes them cry uh that's a good question yeah i i was just i was so proud i actually made michael kramer cry while he was answering (laughs) it so you know it was amazing that's Um, something that can go on a letterhead it's totally right. <laughs> totally. It's a, it's on my resume already. Mm-hmm. I think, Anna, please take over. Save me. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna. I am uh, of the European or also known as the old blood portion of the community. I joined the Discord, I think, around the first spoiler con. And then at the second or last spoiler con, I was a surprise guest. And I surprised many people. That was so epic. um, That was epic. I also participated in the first, that I know of, uh, first sister ceremony that's ever taken place. (laughs) (laughs) That was so cool. Where Nin was actually also I was part of it as well, yes. I was Falron's mom. (laughs) So you're my mother-in-law now. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm your stepmom, Anna. She's your sister now. That's right. I get confused. We also have a birth mom, so, oh no, I'm not, no. <laughs> yeah, and um, I hope that I'm not weirding everyone out with my accent because it's all over the place. I love it. Adds a little bit of flavor to the episode. Uh, I'm from Germany, I didn't say that, I just said Europe. <laughs> Which is what I identify as, like, as European. I asked these lovely ladies to join me because I love their voices and their faces and their thoughts. And I thought it would be really cool to get a collection of spoiler con attendees together. But I also didn't want to wake up at eight in the morning, which is what it would have taken to get an Australian. So (laughs) I limited myself to Germany as the farthest away I was going to make stuff happen. Good to know you picked me for my personality and not for my time zone. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I'm also being yelled at by Discord to promote Broken Earth spoilers. Um, So, hi, I host Broken Earth spoilers. You should read Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin and then come listen to me talk about geology and social justice because that's what that project is. 
Oh, and Kelsey is, if I ever get around to <laughs> doing the next chapter, then you will eventually get to hear Kelsey because she came down and recorded chapter 10. Yes. Me, right meet. before the world went to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a whirlwind. That was a couple. I saw Seth the day before that for a very uskwai induced recording of <laughs> Wheel of Time-ish. I just kind of sat there and laughed in the background for most of it. But yeah, and then I was down to a radius house the next day. A yeah. fun two days. <laughs> yeah, we got to meet Tonky. That was mm-hmm. that was fun. Yeah, as soon as we got down out of the out of my uh, bedroom studio, <laughs> it was like, and we're going back to Canada. So I got I got you just for the podcast <laughs> special delivery. Yeah. Oh, we had such grand plans of like bringing down dinner and having food and like chilling out, catching up, and it's like, nope. Bam, bam. Thank you, man. Popped in for a recording and left right away. It's kind of crap. So I'm looking forward to editing that because it'll be kind of a blast from the past. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but and Seth's already pre-edited it for me, and I believe that somebody who was more organized than I felt capable of being wrote us a list of things to talk about. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I have that Google Doc right in front of my face. Me too. I reject the label of being organized, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have the headspace to make a list, so. <laughs> Did you just presume my organizational skills? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> hey, I've seen you organize. Very chaotic. Arts and Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the first, I think the first item on the list was shooting the shit, and we already did that. Shit gone, I shot. like that I had to explain what shooting the shit was. I, to you. I feel like that, I was so, <laughs> that made me feel so old in general. Like, <laughs> Like what? What You're is this slang than me. these youngsters are using nowadays? <laughs> I did not get that from my age cohort, for the record. <laughs> I got that from my parents' generation. Oh no! So you, so it should be the other way around. Feel too young? Like what? What was the oldies <laughs> using? Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> Fifty. So shall we talk about the fires of heaven? Yeah. Oh, I suppose so. I mean, uh, maybe. Don't you guys just want to hear us bullshit for the rest of, like, two hours? No? <laughs> self-promotion and talking Wait, about how much we love that? each other. I can do self-promotion because I may start a podcast sometimes if, like, corona stops being a thing. Oh, What podcast? What would you do? So, John Algen, who does all the editing for The Boys, asked me if we'd do a Discworld spoilers podcast together about Terry Pratchett. Ooh. And we were about to start that, and then he works... For his work, he has access to an audio studio, but because he's not going into work right now, he can't go there. And so we postponed it for maybe forever. I don't know. But it's the reason I have a microphone now, because... <laughs> that That's pretty cool. What language would you do it in, Anna? Yeah, that, that'd be pretty epic. I'd, I'd listen to that. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's been pre-approved by the boys. It's a... Excellent. It's a farm project. I did. I did the... I did the cover art already, and that's everything that's happened yet. <laughs> oh, it grows. It's growing. Yes, the uh, the daughter podcast population is working on happening. Yes. The farm grows. See, if, if, this is how they get you. First, first you. first you just guest on a thing real quick, just one episode, and then the next thing you know, Seth has you set up with a proper microphone and a recording expectation. They are definitely <laughs> cultivating a team of farmers. That's for sure. Yeah, Seth, <laughs> Seth, that was uh, one of the reasons I said yes, because I knew that when John asked me, I knew that I would not be responsible for any of the technical stuff. It's like, I'm done. I'm fine there. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise I would have been even more freaked out about the idea. The document said we should say how old we were when it was published because that's amazing. Oh, oh yes. Was also three. Yeah, I and I three were three years book. old when this book came out. Are you the same age, you two? Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I don't know what our birth months are, but yeah, we're both turning 30 this year. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nin and I are the same age as well. Oh, these young ones, these <laughs> yeah, babies. Yeah, babies. <laughs> we're five years older than you. Yes. My aged grandmother. God yes. remind me. So we okay, were, boomer. We were... <laughs> so me. So it it came out in ninety three, right? Yeah. So we were eight. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We would turn eight that year. Yeah. Yeah. So Nin actually said that we should talk about the dedication in this book because it is lovely. It says, "For Harriet, the light of her eyes is my light, and the second light Aww. is capitalized, and it's very romantic." It's just... Yeah. I mean, I know the um, guys talk a lot about how the women of Wheel of Time are inspired by Harriet in, in general, like 
how much she impacted him when she he when he was writing the book um and i just i just love this i mean it gives me all goosebumps and like makes me believe in a bigger love than i currently have in my life so Aww. yeah his dedications are really sweet Especially if you put them together, which I never have, but sometimes I just glance at them and it's like so many ways of saying that he, you know, loves his wife. Loves her. Yeah, I think it, it's adorable, especially given that, you know, the women characters sometimes make you wonder how much contention they may be at. Like, I think there are prophecies at the beginning and the back and we could do those. Ooh. Oh, dang. Sure. I like it. With his coming are the dread fires born again, the hills burn and the land turns sear, the tides of men run out and the hours dwindle. The wall is pierced and the veil of parting raised. Storms rumble beyond the horizon and the fires of heaven purge the earth. There is no salvation without destruction, no hope this side of death. Fragment from the Prophecies of the Dragon, belief translated by Indelia Basilane, first made and soared fast to Raiden of Holkuchon, circa 400 AB. Nice. Beautiful. Wow. Beautiful. Nice. So this is approximately... Shortly after, just roll with it. Somebody wrote this, right? <laughs> right. 400 AB. Is that after, after breaking? Oh, after breaking. I thought after last time, you're right. After breaking. Oh, okay. So it's a prop. Yeah. I was super confused already. Nice. Oh, so it's before before the whole series happens, right? Way like before. I believe so. Way okay. before. But yeah, it says Fires of Heaven. So we know where the title comes from. I know that there yeah. was a discussion if this uh, relates to... Uh, the raining down of fire during the battle with Ravine or whatever. But in this, it sounds more like a metaphorical storms rumble beyond the horizon and the fires of heaven perch the earth. It's a really dramatic, apocalyptic, Ragnarok sort of feel. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love the, the no hope, this side of death. Mm-hmm. It's just like, whoa, that's heavy. Yeah, and it also means that there is hope on the other side of death which Mm -hmm. is actually a positive thing. Right. And it really is very relevant to Rand, right? To die, you must, or to live, you must die. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. even Matt. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. The poetry is just so nice. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. No one can really criticize RJ for his lack of prose because there isn't really. Looks like we're going to talk about Rand, I guess. Yeah. We thought we'd go through the storylines a little bit divided. I have a, a general note, though, if you guys don't mind. Um, I kind of went through a bunch of wiki stuff, like I'm sure you guys did, too. But in the in this book, there are obviously a whole bunch of POVs. But I looked up the actual percentages, and the top three is Rand with 29.9% of the POVs of the book. Nynaeve is 29.6% of the other POVs of the book. So already that's, you know, half the book, just those two. So I can understand why people kind of get fed up with the circus stuff because it's a lot of being in Min's head and you know listening to her thoughts all the time. And then the third percent is Egwene with seven point five percent of the point of views. Everybody else is under seven percent of point of views for the rest of the book. So it just kind of goes to show how much you see of Rand and his thoughts and his brain throughout the entire Fires of Heaven and Nin as well. Yeah, and in the end, it's it actually is. The, I mean, the big battle actually goes simultaneously with Rand and with Nynaeve. So this makes sense. Like. They are mm-hmm. both protagonists of this book almost exactly at the same time. Yeah. While almost not meeting. <laughs> yeah. And it was interesting because everybody else, like Egwene is 7.5% perspective in Fires of Heaven. And then everybody else is under 7%. Moraine herself has 0.58% perspective in the entire book. I think I also nerded out. <laughs> like less than 1% of her perspective. She has almost nothing in the whole series, I think. Yeah. We get into her head very rarely. Yeah, 0.58%. Which makes her so intriguing in the beginning that you don't really know what her deal is. Yeah, so we see her perspective in chapter 7 and mm-hmm. chapter 52. And those are the only times we see her perspective in the entire yeah. book. And which is kind of dies. Yeah, which I found crazy because it makes her death almost more emphasized at the end because you really don't see, you only see her from really Rand's perspective or. Mostly Rand's, yeah. Yeah, basically Rand's perspective perspective so it kind of emphasizes it yeah so yeah rand rand in this book is in the waste in the beginning then he leads the aiel down to the wetlands then we have the second battle of kyrian and um after that he decides to put a pop a cap of um ravine <laughs> i mean he debates killing samuel first and then he says ah one after the other 
the the rate at which he's like picking and choosing which forsaken to take out is like wow god powers okay <laughs> yep of course there's this progressing madness which i think has been talked about in the podcast a lot i don't know if you think that we have anything to add to that i don't think there's really much to add about the madness itself i do think that something that might contribute a lot to his state of mind throughout this book is the amount of pain that he's in because of the wound in his side. I don't think that really gets addressed as much as I think it might need to be because you look at animals in pain or people in pain all the time dealing with chronic pain of any kind, that's going to change their mood and their personality quite a bit when dealing with situations. So I just, I don't know if that's something that I kind of thought of a lot because it's not really discussed his wound too much until the battle really throughout the book, but the entire book he's dealing with this gigantic throbbing wound in the side of his torso. <laughs> So that's just an interesting point that I thought, you know, pain affects a lot of things when people make decisions. Yeah, that always gets me at the the bonding scene, um, which isn't in this book. But when the oh, yeah. when the girls all feel his pain and are like, dude, yeah. how are you even functioning? Yeah. And I think even even Alana, the dumb, I'm not saying it, uh, <laughs> she mentions he's in so much pain. I don't know how he can take it. Right. And like, I can't do that. Like, I have a freaking hangnail or a headache, and I am like, the world is over, stop <laughs> everything. And Rand yeah. is like, oh yeah, I'm like bleeding constantly from this thing, and like I've got brands in my hands, and oh yeah, I like have the pressure of the whole world on my shoulders. It's like, how do you even function, sir? No wonder you're going nuts, like taint or no taint. Yeah, and his points of view are always like his, his thoughts about what his next move is going to be, how he's handling a certain decision, his conversations with people around him. It's never talking about his feelings about stuff that you, you never really see him be like, Oh, this really hurts today or whatever, you know, like you, it's never addressed by himself. It's just something that you have to know as the reader that's going on in the background. So hopefully maybe apply it to why he decides to do half the stuff he does. Uh, I feel like <laughs> Bambi, reason... what are feelings? <laughs> <laughs> that is ran for a lot of the, lot of the books. What are feelings? <laughs> I, I think yeah. there's, there's something about the no nonsense way he's been brought up in. Mm hmm which definitely contributes to that like not not play up on what he thinks is tiny issues um and also so we get this like headache gel thing in india which you can put on your forehead and it it's supposed to help you like um like calm your headache down or like reduce the uh, intensity of the headache and it burns so bad it's like the worst thing to put on your face <laughs> that essentially like we laugh about it but i really think that the reasoning behind that is that if that thing is burning so bad you will forget about your headache because now you'll be <laughs> focused on the burning that your forehead is <laughs> so and and i feel like rand is facing essentially you know the biggest burning um that anyone can he he has the burden of saving the world on his on his shoulders and so maybe that makes him minimize his own pain a little bit I think he's also in the void quite, quite a that's true, yeah. bit of the time, yeah. which is basically about not realizing your fear, feelings and not letting them take over. And yeah, it's somebody said, yeah, Bambi said, it's the transition to Darth Rand, which is basically his all whole, my feelings don't matter, pain is not important, even if it's other people's pain at some point. Yeah, and I guess he's also very distracted with, the politicking basically in regards to the IAL the whole time. And then as well with the Terrans and the Karyanans, like he, he's been trying to learn and what am I trying to say here? He's been trying to learn so much in such a short period of time and try and enforce these rules and actions and make, you know, proper Royal decisions. You know, these are things that he's trying to enact that Elaine has been taught to do since birth. And she's been trained to do since birth, which basically all Royals are trained to do since birth is basically play the game of houses and learn how to lead a country or lead your house or lead your... So that's a constant strain on him as well, is trying to process all of these things in such a short amount of time and figure right. out how this whole diplomatic world works. So that's probably also a huge distraction, I would think, as well. And I think when you just said it, he learns a lot. I think he learns a lot in this book, um, mainly about letting other people maybe fight for him. It's a struggle continuously, but here it is at the forefront a lot with the maidens. Yeah, it's really forced into his face that you, you have to allow other people to do things for you. 
Yeah, they're really, really mad at him. It's pretty much the only pain he ever acknowledges is the pain of that choice. That's like the only pain that he lets get in his way. <laughs> yeah, and you know, as the series goes on, he, he almost, that, that list he makes in his head, I almost feel like he funnels whatever pain he feels physically, like the wound in his side or anything else. He he funnels that into that list. It's like, oh, the list gets even more stronger in his own brain and the feelings about those women getting killed in his own brain get stronger because that's where he's forcing his pain to go, in a sense. Does it annoy you as much as it does me that he makes such a difference between dead men and dead women? Yes. Because it makes me mad every single time this list thing comes up or the doesn't want the maidens to fight thing comes up. I don't get it. I mean, they're fighters and he, yeah. he values them so much. It makes me so mad. I understand his reasoning. I don't agree with it. But I, I, I understand his reasoning and I understand why he's choosing to be blinded by what the maidens want. Because he, he's trying to be protective and he's trying to keep everybody safe that he possibly can. And I understand that feeling when you are such an ignorant young 20 year old, right? You have these base emotions that you're trying to still grapple with. I don't know. Maybe if he had more experience and he was a 40 year old Rand dealing with all this, it'd be a bit different because he's still so young. He is trained as a rural farm kid to protect it. all those who need protected who can't protect themselves. I mean, if maybe not said in those words, but that's something that's been instilled in him since he was a kid. That's everybody supports each other and protects each other to make a community work. And how he sees that is keeping everybody as safe as possible so that people can keep living to keep doing the work needed. So I, I, I get why he does his actions. I don't agree with them. And I think he should learn from people around him and listen to their perspectives. But I do understand. Uh, to your question, Bambi, if we think that he gets it here, I think you're referring to getting that other people have to fight for him. I don't think he really gets it here, but it, he gets forced to let them because the maidens just take no shit. They beat him, actually beat him up until he lets them go. I think he also like pushes some of his, like Kelsey was saying, like he puts a lot of his pain into that list. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like LTT in his head as like an expression of his tension and madness. Like he's able to compartmentalize and it's not a very good way to do it, but he's, it's like, that's, that's how he can like self harm in a way that like gets him through the next day. Yeah. That's his coping mechanism in a sense. Um, what do you think if Matt had actually been killed here? I mean, he almost died from Melindra and... Oh, not Melindra. Yeah, was it Melindra? Yeah, Melindra. The, yeah, Melindra. Yeah, the, the chick, and then he almost died from the Dark Hounds, and then he died and didn't die from the attack on Ravine. If Matt had died, do you think he would have made the list? No. He would have gone on whatever the, the ancillary list is that has Mangan. Mm -hmm. Maybe oh. he wouldn't have gone on the list, but I can't imagine Rand not feeling guilty about it. Maybe maybe that would have broken the list because... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just occurred to me. Ladies list and bros list, yeah. I mean, like how he feels about Egwene at the end. Mm -hmm. And then she has to admonish him like, hey, I'm allowed to be a hero too. Like, this is my decision. I walked into this. Stop yeah. feeling guilty about it. Yeah, and this is what we see in this book with the maidens, and we see it also with Brigitte uh, later, or not later, but later in our discussion, when uh, she says to Nynaeve, mm -hmm. don't take this away from me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, that whole perspective and that whole point is really enforced from Brigitte and from the maidens being like, don't take our choices away from us. Let us make our own choices. Right. For God's sake, man. <laughs> Get the point in your head. If Brigitte had gotten to lay that lecture onto Rand, that would have been good. Brigitte should have been like, yo, yo, lose, get it together. Oh, yeah, she would have set him straight. Yeah, we see that theme really forced out of the books onto us as a reader from various perspectives. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's a theme. <laughs> <laughs> um, another, if we're moving on to Matt, another thing that I kind of, throughout this whole book, kind of realized about him is that only a small handful of people have experienced his, like his memories and his reflections coming through, like a very small handful of people have seen him be those generals from the past. So it's kind of interesting, like, I find that he grows in this book, but he also stays very much the same. He stays very true to, to Two Rivers Matt still, even though he's had, he has these new memories and new reflections and new experiences in his head. Um, it's only towards the end of the book with the battle that we really see his public display of those memories come through, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. He's still coming to terms with what it means to have them. 
It goes perfectly with that with that quote I put in there because I love that quote so much. <laughs> it's such a good yeah. quote. <laughs> I'm a gambler, a farm boy, and I'm here to take command of your bloody army. It is glorious. <laughs> it is glorious. And we like that it, it kind of shows his arc, but at the end where he actually, you know, displays his his true skills to to land in the tent and obviously through the battle itself, collecting people as he goes and finds himself in the thick of it. It kind of subconsciously has him accept who he is now and has him accept what's going on in his head, I find, even if he's not willing to admit it yet out loud. (laughs) Bambi just made the best comment. It reveals his hand, as it were. (laughs) (laughs) And I love that so much. (laughs) But I'm dumb. (laughs) Yeah, but it's true. Because I think this is the book where like Matt is able to integrate with himself the fact that he has all these memories and he works out the timeline and he like creates the ability to like know when he's in his own mind versus another mind. Like this is the book where he finds that balance that Perrin takes like a billion books deciding is possible. <laughs> like Matt mm-hmm. kind of like, this is the book where he goes through that whole process and we don't see a lot of it until there's the conclusion of him being like, I have to win a battle just to get away from the battle or something. <laughs> Fine, I'll take charge so that we can get over with this and I can go back to, you know, carousing the maidens in the bar or whatever. Since you guys can't make it work, I'm going to make it work for you. You want something yeah. done right, do it yourself. Matt has yeah. major delegation issues. He really doesn't know how to manage. <laughs> but he really, he really likes teaching people songs and dances. Really likes that. Oh yeah, this is the book where Jack of the Shadows gets introduced. Mm-hmm. Right. It comes out yeah, of his he memories doesn't... as he's trying to distract himself from getting sewn up, I think, after the yeah. battle. Yeah, he doesn't realize until after that it's a very old song that no one really remembered. Yeah. It's so good, though. We follow Lord Matt wherever he leads. I was so looking forward to us all being able to sing it together. I know. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I cannot sing to save my life. That's not happening. Well, if we'd all been drunk and in a room full of 200 yes. other people, yes, would yes. have been fine. <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> drunk karaoke is the best. <laughs> Indeed. Sober karaoke is sad. Because yeah. it's either really bad or you're really good and then it's kind of boring. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I used to work at a bar where we'd had kar- we had karaoke night every first Saturday of the month. And there was always the two different groups. The one group that was there just to get wasted and have a hilarious time. And the other group that was there to, like, they were auditioning for The Voice or something, you oh, know? Wow. Obviously, they were super skilled, but they would drink Diet Cokes only. They'd sing for four hours, and they all pick, like, their ballads to sing just to show off to the ten people who were sitting in the bar that day. It was, it was very bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> karaoke, to me, is very much just go out, have a lot of drinks, and have a really hilarious time. That's my kind of karaoke. <laughs> yes. So I have actually never been to karaoke. Oh, I have to rectify that. I've, I've heard a lot about it, but never actually done it. Yeah. Oh man. Girls. When you first experience it, you have to have at least three fireball shots under your belt. <laughs> then you can get on stage. <laughs> and you have to pick a song that, no matter how good you do, you will uh, how well you do, it will never sound good. So you can only fuck it up. That's the trick. Uh, Gilad, we did do stunt karaoke at at one point. Um, it was really fun, but what you can't do is singing together over Discord because the the lag just makes it really really weird. Oh right, yeah. But we we had a we had a we had some time where we had regular sing sing alongs or something on the on the stump. I remember that. Yeah, my Aikido classes have been meeting online, and it's funny getting counted through the exercises because, like, you look at those video screens, and none of us are on time. Even though, like, <laughs> we're all following the count, but like the video lags, it's just it's horrible. Yeah, that's that's that, that, I'm just imagining that and laughing at it. <laughs> um, my my partner actually had a birthday last week, and um, he did a virtual cake party, and there were like. I think 21 people in the call at one point, including children. And then they decided to sing happy birthday. Oh, and what happened God. was everybody realized that everybody else was behind, stopped. And then everybody, it was, oh, no. it was glorious anarchy. <laughs> Just a mashed potato of a song. Wow. It was so good. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I also loved having 20 guests and not having to clean up after. So I think I'm, I'm doing this all the time now. <laughs> I'm hanging at a party. If there's like one we, had, we actually had a we actually had a face cam and a cake cam for everybody to see the cake. Oh, nice! Oh, yeah, nice. it was good. That's genius. That's adorable. And now we're making the tensions of heaven title 
doing it proud. (laughs) (laughs) I do love the, I'm just going to plug Patreon and the Discord here real quick, because we do have the stump channel for those who have no idea what that even means. It's a voice channel in Discord that you can click into if you're a patron, 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 whatever the word, um, that you can click into and chat with other patrons in the Discord. So it's kind of sweet that you can actually talk in person, kind of like we are now. Um, with other Discord users and Watt fans. So if you were debating whether or not to become a supporter of Watt Spoilers, that's a really good incentive. You should talk about uh, Stumpinars when we're, while we're on it, Aurelia. We have Stumpinars where all of us nerds have special interests and tell them to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Overset voice channel. Come to the stump. Hence the, hence the weird name. Yes, yes, because... <laughs> and, and the name Stump comes from the Great Stump from Ogier. And the videos are available on YouTube. If you look up Stumpinars, we have a whole YouTube channel where I've posted oh, really? all of the things. Oh, I didn't know that. No, Bambi, your two-hour climate change ramble with Jaleer was awesome. Dude, You don't yes. have to apologize for that. Yeah, the, a two-hour discussion from the east coast of the U.S. and frickin' Australia. They were both at inconvenient times a day, and it was this amazing discussion about why climate change is a goddamn mess. And I loved it so much. Really good. And I don't edit those, by the way, guys. Those are straight up just the raw video, the raw audio. I just slap a video onto it so it can go on YouTube. I had no idea they were on YouTube. That is sweet. Yeah, I made a YouTube channel, a Google account, like the whole thing. That's cool. That's sweet. So yeah, you don't have to catch them live. You can catch them later. Uh, I mean, if you're waxing poetic about being on the Discord, I can add to that. I think I I joined over a year ago and legit it's changed my life. Like, I don't oh, think man. I'd, yeah. I don't think I'd be able to get through this, this weird time without everyone on discord in general. Like people have been so supportive, so motivating, like so encouraging. I just, I feel like I've made some best friends, even though I don't know their real names or faces. <laughs> you know. And yeah. Some, it's such yeah. a cool world. Hey, right. I mean, it's so, it's, it's such a supportive community and some of that changes as you meet people on SpyloCon and JordanCon, but I wouldn't even have gone to... Turns out they're actually assholes, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, Anna, you would know. (laughs) I hate you all so much. That's exactly why I went all the way to Germany to meet Anna a few months after SpyloCon happened as well. When she says all the way, she already was in Belgium, so it was an hour. (laughs) Anna, let's pretend it was just to meet you. Okay, okay, fine. Nobody knows. It was <laughs> my sister's PhD defense. She was completing her PhD. That's why I had gone to Belgium. But she jumped on a train, came over to me, and I yep. made her breakfast. And it was amazing. It was what a day. It was so fantastic. Even though it was rainy, but like none of that mattered. <laughs> right. And we went back to the. I took you back to the railway station, and uh, then we sat down at a cafe, and then we started to talk Wheel of Time, actually, and she almost missed her missed train, my, and we had to sprint yeah. through the station. <laughs> and, like, these are the kind of memories you make that go in your memoir, and I just, I couldn't have yeah. made it without joining Discord. So, yeah. Yeah. A- end of my waxing poetic statement. <laughs> <laughs> I can add to that. I think the the whole online community really helps me in these days, because actually nothing changes in that because I don't see those people or you people anyway, every day. So it stays exactly the same and that helps. It's the kind of stability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So much has not changed and changed. Discord is a nice point of constancy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Even though there's definitely, you know, Discord obviously is discussing all of the changes, but at least it's the same people and the same access to the same people. More access in some case, because people are home more often. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. that's true. Super Chicken! I had the best conversation with Super Chicken when we were doing the walk um, that Aradia and Ogier led. Oh, so amazing. So, like, my heart was full after that. Yeah, meeting Super Chicken was awesome. And then, yeah, that part where we all got random tattoos together. Oh, no! <laughs> so, yes. we, we are not a cult. Nope. We're, kind of a cult. we're a little bit of a cult. <laughs> one of us! One of us! I did not get the tattoo, though. You will. Just in my heart. <laughs> well, some of it us didn't known. get it the day of, you know, like they, they keep trickling in. I got mine like two weeks later. No, it started with four of us going out at Spoiler Con itself and getting our tattoos done together in a room. And then it branched out to like another 10 plus people or something like that within a week or two after Spoiler Con happened. So now there's this whole album of 
a bunch of us with Wheel of Time, either like the Nodding Raven, one of the chapter headings, or like the Event of Sorrow Leaf or whatever else. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of us now that have forever ink on our bodies. I'm totally planning on getting the other raven. I only got one of the Nodding Ravens because I have all the intentions of getting the other one, hopefully in group, or at least as a memory for another time we all got physically together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd never been part of a, an online server or online community before joining this Discord. So all of this is ve was very new. Like I, I lurked and listened to the podcast for I don't know how long before I'm like, yeah, you know what? Maybe I'll check out this Discord thing. And <laughs> two years ago, I was scared thankful. of weird, weird, strange people on the internet. And um, yeah, then in October, I flew to the United States without knowing anybody <laughs> there. So in September, this Discord does crazy things to you. Yeah, definitely not on my own. I have to say, <laughs> I just yeah, was one of the weirder things I've done in my life. It is. I mean, even I, when I was telling people, oh, I'm flying to Portland to meet a bunch of strangers I met online, everyone was like, oh, give us the address of the hostel just in case you disappear. <laughs> I can't even imagine how what Anna, like, oh, I'm flying like, halfway across the world. <laughs> Seriously. Anna, you're all kinds of good crazy. Thank you. <laughs> so you want to circle it back to uh, the circus? Ooh, the sure. Circus. Oh, yes. Where, where Brigitte part. joins the cast in a with a bang. Yep. My favorite part. There's a reason I'm called Nin. <laughs> oh, is this is this your why you went for Nin? Yes, I was actually naive when I joined the Discord, and then you know the same. Um, what's the not a warning? Just the same message that everyone gets of changing oh, yeah, their yeah. names from you know the name in the book. So I. Um, anyway, uh, like I, I use this everywhere. This is my gamer tag and nobody can pronounce it. So everyone just says Nin anyway. So I was like, yeah, might as well just make that my standard become Nin. Wait, but, wait, wait. Do they say Nin anyway or do they say Nin anyway? No, they, well, that too. <laughs> once, no. actually, I, once um, on Twitch. <laughs> That's actually how you can pronounce it, Nin anyway. You can totally. <laughs> Once oh on my Twitch, goodness. Twitch, the oh. streamer called me my navel because she couldn't understand what my navel like. It it was my Eve Al. That's what I had put the my Twitch name as, and she was like my navel. I always thought she was called Ninave. <laughs> me too. Me too. I, all my life I called her Ninave before actually the podcast corrected me. Wow. Yeah, because of the because of the Arthurian connection, I think that Ninave, the lady from the, of the lake and everything. So the best thing that happened at SpoilerCon was I dressed up as Min for the costume thing. And Seth was like, Nin, Min, Nim. Min. Okay, back to Nin. Back to Nin and the circus. You, you, like, you, like, this, you like this story because in the Google Doc, I actually put in the circus girls. Why do people hate the storyline so much? You don't. Because it's almost 30% of the book in Nynaeve's head. That's what I, I just I still love out. it. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, a bunch of dudes who read fantasy don't like being in a female's head. Fancy that. <laughs> Aww. I have waxed and waned on how I feel about the circus scenes. Like, the first few times I went through the series, loved it. Next several times, got really bored. And, like, now I'm kind of coming back around to enjoying it. Like, I just have so many feelings about it. Because, like, the way I describe it is, like, the first couple of books, like, are very, like, action-packed normal fantasy. And then, like, the slog quotes is the part where, like, Jordan just puts you in the Google car with the 360, like, camera. And you can just look at the whole world in all of its nitty-gritty boring detail right for books and books and books which like if you love the world it's awesome because you get to see all of these like little bits and pieces and and details but if you just want to like see how rand wins the last battle then it's like any book now <laughs> would be great yeah. i really like it and yeah that yes they do snark at each other a lot but i think it makes so much sense like you understand their frustration in this situation so I don't mind it. I don't think it makes them bad people. No, and I kind of like watching Nynaeve throughout the circus chapters, and I guess the whole book in general, because like she, when you think about it as, you know, from a Two Rivers standpoint, and her, and her whole wisdom stuff aside, like she's the oldest of the group of kids that left the Two Rivers. And she is the only person who reflects back to that as much as she does, right? Like she's the only person who thinks back to their time of 
you know, being in Emmons field and switching bottoms and changing diapers. Like she reflects back a lot. Like she's very maternal and you see a lot of maternalness, mater- whatever that word is, <laughs> come out in her in this book. And I, I think it's those little sparks of her reminiscing that kind of makes her a lot more relatable to me. Cause I mean, as stubborn and forthright and angry and whatever she is, she still has that maternal protective instinct of the group that left and I, I find like throughout the book and throughout the series she's the only one who really draws back to those experiences when they were kids like some of them like Rand will look back like being a sheep herder or they'll look back to times and experiences but they won't reflect on the feelings they had I find Nynaeve really reflects back on her feelings about being from there more than the others do that's a good point she also left to take them back she literally said to everybody wait don't move I'll be back in a second with these people and she never managed that. Mama bear coming out, right? Like, no, no, I gotta go collect my cubs. I gotta go bring them back. <laughs> she never managed that. Actually, she she loses, like, one after another. And in the end, she hangs out mostly with Elaine, which she didn't set out to protect. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's got that guilt. And who's <laughs> possibly not super easy to be with. Don't get me wrong. I love Elaine. I'll, I'll protect her against uh, internet people to my last breath. But still, I would yeah. not want to be shot in a circus wagon with her <laughs> yeah. or with Nighty. god no yeah literal nail scratching cat bites and that really randomly reminds me so so the scene where they talk about her about elaine cooking as though she's in the palace when the <laughs> fuck did a princess actually learn how to be a five-star chef this is a completely unrelated complaint, but like, how would she know how to manifest the fancy food that she's eaten her whole life? Well, maybe, maybe her mother is one of these people who say, yeah, you're a princess, but I don't know, once a week you have to do chores in the palace. And maybe she just liked to cook. And so she asked the cooks and they indulged her, basically. I'll take that headcanon. Yeah, it's a hobby, right? Yeah, I, made, I imagine her training involved all kinds of stuff, all kinds of extensive. Yeah, I think her extensive uh, training would have incorporated something like you have to see what the people the normal people in the in the palace do uh, remember that more gays likes to hang out uh, with the common people in disguise so i think she she wouldn't she wouldn't want her daughter to be completely shut off from everything and so she would let her hang out in the kitchen and everything and if she likes it well she really likes sweets so thomas that's right and also more gays knew that she was gonna go to the tower right because that was a thing that happens and Morghese has been there herself she knows how you gotta get down on your knees in the kitchen and all that um not 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 in the dirty way but well maybe in the dirty <laughs> way uh so <laughs> so she was like you know th- this could be sort of this could be some sort of prep for going to the tower i had never thought of that thank you ladies for helping me establish head canon. <laughs> i just wanted to say how dumb it is that they have to get on their knees and scrub the floors every day and and they also make them wear white dresses yeah oh my god yeah that's crazy well they do have magic to clean the dresses though so do you think they do you think they no, would have I... used magic to clean the floor though yeah no, uh, that wouldn't teach the lessons needed though <laughs> <laughs> that won't build the character needed yeah i don't think they're allowed to Anytime I think of building character or that phrase, I think of Calvin and Hobbes. Yes. And dad. yes. <laughs> Every yes, single time. Exactly. Without fail. Every time. Oh my God. Calvin's dad is... Uh, my dad looked up to Calvin's dad. <laughs> um, what else about the circus? I mostly just have notes on Nin. And the, the reappearance of Uno, which is a big upside. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, right. Because this is, this is the whole scene where Nynaeve tells the prophet to go stick a spoon up his ass and comes away with Shinar and bodyguards. <laughs> yeah, the, it's the prophet, yeah. God, the prophet, like, is one of the most cartoonish villains in this whole thing. And he's so ineffective. He could have been such... He could have been a powerful thing. It's a very strange, like, addition to the story, you know? Like, I've never quite... Like, when I... I've always read over the prophet stuff as kind of more skimmed it. I had never really understood, like I didn't really tie it into the rest of the series as much as maybe I should have because it never really seemed too naturally for me, you know? Yeah. I think he's supposed to mirror this other kind of evil which Andoral is a, or Shadow Logoth is an example of this. You want to do good and then you go over the moral event of Rise and then you become bad, approach bad from the other side or something. But yeah he's just oh he's so awful 
I hate him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was necessary, I think, for there to be, like, a zealot, because Rand does have so much religious overtones, even in a world that doesn't have religion. So, like, we needed someone to be a zealot, but... Yeah, it yeah. is a good, it's a good, perfect example of good intentions trying to be gained through bad action. The means justify the ends kind of thing, where mm-hmm. the means are very evil. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, like, super ineffective, too. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really even create... I mean, like, the White Clothes, at least, are an effective military force. <laughs> The prophet's mobs are a mob. And then Bambi is pointing out that there was the whole, he was probably being brainwashed by the Forsaken or or compulsed by the Forsaken to be extra ineffectively problematic. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in chaos. He was, but I I don't feel he he had to. So is that why you think maybe he has that crazy look in his eye more than not? Because everybody notices how almost like glazed over his eyes are. Do you think that's, you know, and like we see everybody who is com- like under compulsion. Yeah, but he also doesn't eat. <laughs> I I feel like, is this a conversation that's happened before? Is this one of those uh, was... Uh, Kuladin? Kuladin, yeah. Is this similar to the was Kuladin um, influenced by the Forsaken sort of discussion? That That is a good parallel. Yeah, because it's hard to tell because you have an asshole who's already maybe mentally unstable, goes through some traumatic shit, and then appears to be manipulated by the Forsaken. Where do you draw the line on pulling out the Forsaken from the rest of it? Exactly. I mean, it's it's what an effective villain would do. Find someone who's easy to push over the edge. Right, yeah. pushing more gays so, over uh, the edge <laughs> would be a lot harder, as we see with Ravine. No, oh, we, we can talk about that, by the way. Yeah, and maybe they didn't... Maybe he wasn't under compulsion, but maybe they started him on the path and he just he was so crazy that he just needed a nudge to walk down that path anyway yeah flicker flicker also fucked with him Mm -hmm, exactly yep you take that breaking point and then just amplify it add a little couple seeds here and there and the first the first time we meet him he has this unreasonable hate towards Rand just because his hair is red basically um which shows that he has some ptsd and or asshole syndrome (laughs) <laughs> already probably wasn't hard for him to go over this yeah and yeah i think enough enough has been said about his tactics of helping the poor by making more people oh. poor <laughs> um yeah <sighs> yeah no. he does start a very important war though i mean the galad and and the where the prophet and the white cloaks meet i mean that ends up being an important like conflict for pushing stuff around in that region. I mean, it probably helps destabilize the throne, so that way Aleandra ends up coming along with Perrin later. Like, he's a good stick to stir the pot with. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, pots are getting stirred in this book. It's, it's, a lot happens that has big effects later. That's another reason why it's yeah. a sloggy, right? It's because it's setting you up for books later. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it does set up a lot. Yeah, I know you added this in the conclusion, but I feel like that's a point that will come up again and again. Like, it is the book that shifts um, the story into next gear. Like It does. Like, it yeah. sets up so many things. Yeah, plot-wise and character-wise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we we just mentioned Morgay, so we can go on to her right now. Yeah. She has a backbone of steel. Oh, man. To be resistant to a Forsaken's compulsion at all, much less to the degree she pulls it off, it's like girl (laughs) it's so hard to be in her head just that innate will you just know you know there's a a huge force there yeah her strength of personality i think we all agree that these books have some rape centered storylines which are not done very well i think this one is done really well because it's never gratuitous we don't ever see anything happening and but what we see is how much it fucks with her head and the the whole guilt she keeps on having which she has about the state of her of her country but it it's a good it's a good analogy for survivors guilt or the guilt that many survivors of sexual violence have for being tainted no pun intended um by the whole thing and she never sheds this i mean it's one of the reasons that she doesn't want to be queen ever again which was her complete her entire identity was tied to being this queen and she can't do this because this guy took it from her yeah when you go through a trauma like that you then feel unfit to accomplish many tasks that you might have previously thought you could and Morgaze is a perfect example of that and Nynaeve is also an example of that all the trauma that she goes through in 
Teleron Riyadh and seeing how women deal with trauma and then try to overcome it by telling themselves that they shouldn't feel guilty and but it affects them anyways. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of parallels, but they handle it a little bit differently. Yeah, Blade and Stormchair just mentioned how even after this whole traumatic thing, how competent she acts when she is in the White Cloak stronghold later, which is not in this book, I think, but yeah, admirable. Absolutely. Yeah, it's next book, right? Yeah. But she, she starts on this journey. She flees Camelin. She collects her ragtag band of, like, they actually sound to me like a and d group. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's true. Yeah. This combination of different people who really don't get along. And then you have Lini. With all, with all the one-liners, I I uh, put one at uh, the best one. I the think best. In. It's the best one. Yes. It's at my age. If it ma- if even if I make it up, it's still an old saying. It's uh, yeah. Lini is the bard, right? Lini is amazing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting to see more gazes like how she handles all of that because she's one of the most powerful, confident, strong-willed women in literally the entire articulated world of the books and she is broken so much and has so much processing to do and yeah it's hard to read her stuff but like it's kind of like well if a queen can get brought that low then like anyone can right and if she can pick herself back up it reminds me of um i don't know if you guys have watched jessica jones yep but no no. okay well i i only watched it because i read so much stuff about how excellent it was at depicting like the aftermath of trauma and people getting over their trauma without it being gratuitous like horror porn and or violence porn or whatever and i watched it and i would agree with it like it's it reminds me of her like jessica and Morgays are not incredibly dissimilar characters in how they like magical overpowering forces against them and they just drink their way through it and figure it out i don't know how much more gays drinks her way through it it's it's interesting to see how she processes it and like how like Brianna and Lini respond to her trauma and like the shit she goes through particularly she doesn't really talk about Ravine much with anybody but she totally talks well they see her experience the white cloaks right and their two experience their way they to react to her is also mm-hmm. like two mm-hmm. different angles right like you aren't dead suck it up versus like take the space you need to come to terms with that yeah, you literally have to live through however long that period of time was where all of your decisions were taken away from you and your complete and utter, you know, free will was taken away from you. Now you have to process that that's what happened to you. I don't know. That's terrifying to me. You know, it's it's almost like you have been lobotomized, but you're still walking around as the shell of a carcass and you have vague memories of it. You have no idea that all your allies have been thrown out of the palace at your own orders. You have no idea, you know, all these things that happened while you were still in power, like all of this power that she had that was used and abused in her name and she ha- has no reflection of it or no recollection of it. That's a terrifying thing to come to terms with. I can imagine. And we don't really see too, too much of that. We just see it from the darkness that she lets out sometimes. And then through, yeah, Lenny and Brianna's perspectives. I, I always thought that, I mean, Ravin gets killed, but he didn't get his come up and swap the shit he did. No, because, uh, no. he well, should, he, he sure didn't. No, that should have been, he should Drawn have out. been killed by a woman <laughs> and up and close. He was set on fire by a woman. That That's good. He does I, get, I like that. He gets encased in fire and has to live with that for like a whole 30 seconds before he gets obliterated. So it's not truly fair, but... Yeah, I agree with Bambi saying that she thinks it's on purpose. I do think he makes it tumultuous for a reason. To kind of throw our perspectives up in the air and kind of make us think all topsy-turvy as we're going into the next book or as we're going into waiting for the next book, as some of you guys, I guess, had to do. (laughs) I never had to do. Yeah. Speaking of other interesting things that I don't get, um, the beginning of Swan and Bryn is in this book. Mm -hmm. And there's a relationship that... Oh, I have such a huge man crush on Gareth. Oh. (laughs) I I don't get their whole relationship, honestly. (laughs) What? I mean, again, this is just the plot line and... uh, both of their character arcs that sets up for the rest of the series, basically. I feel bri- bad for Brian like the whole time because like more gays. She she I, I don't know what sort of complicated relationship he has with more gays, but I I feel I don't feel like she treated him very well, and like he deserved so much more. He was so dedicated, so loyal, and and then you see him get with Swan, and you know that's just I I loved it. Like I love that relationship. 
I love it too. It's, it's super. It's super tropey. It is, yeah, yeah. You know, but sometimes you need you need that happy ending. You know, I mean, and then yeah, it wasn't yeah. that happy ending, but you know, it was what yeah, it was. Yeah, but the the whole they hate each other, they love each other, they're super much into each other, so they give each other shit, and then. But I still love it, but because I love both of them so much, I think Swan is such a great complex character, and he's just so mm-hmm. solid. I think many many women unflappable just because he's just so super solid. And I do like seeing Swan go through her own issues with her oath that she swears to him right like you see somebody who at the top of her power for so many years all of a sudden and also a short period of time dressed completely down power is taken away her own confidence has been broken and then she swears herself basically to this guy that she gave a lashing to once <laughs> you know um and then seeing her go through that more in the next book i guess or well, in the rest of the series but just seeing her like this is where it starts for her where she kind of grapples with herself and grapple grapples with her own strength of will because she really has to you know rein herself in to actually listen to what he wants to do and that kind of sets her up for the rest of the series i find right and as leia just mentioned they bond each other or she bonds him and then they understand their motivations better and um yeah and they get along really well with that so seth asked what do you think about how he handles the compulsion compulsion which one do you mean the compulsion that was put on him during the last battle or about the more gay stuff because he I think that he handles the more gay stuff really, really badly because he just refuses to acknowledge that she might not be super guilty of everything. The one in the last battle, he was awesome with. <laughs> like, I think I'm stepping back because I seem to be dumb right now. Yeah, the only one that does it better is Iteralda, who, like, ends up in that whole, like, he's frozen because he knows he shouldn't give the order, but he has to give the order. But yeah. Bryn is like, something's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. Mm-hmm. So that that's badass. And I think it's interesting that's, with yeah. the Swan and, and Bryn because Leanne is the one that's like, I'm going to, like, fuck all the guys and probably all the girls, too. <laughs> like, I'm just going full on green fuck Aja. And then Swan is like, I'm just going to stay a blue. I'm going to stay what I was always doing. But she still ends up going through this transformation in which she, like, suddenly has room in her life for romantic love that was never there before. That's that's kind of trippy. She deserved that. I mean, like, because he's solid. For all that there's a lot of contention there, like, she deserved to unexpectedly land in some comfort. I just don't get the attraction, that's all. <laughs> I'm glad she got it. <laughs> While I'm saying that I love this storyline, or this love story between them, I still say that she should end up with uh, Moraine, because this is the big love, but, well, chance missed. Ugh, yeah, that would have been the best, but... That would have been, yeah. I really wanted to see them, like, also retire to a little farmhouse somewhere. Like Adelaide and Van With a lake or ocean nearby, I guess, so Swan can do her thing and (laughs) fish all the time. Yeah. I don't know, that would have been really cool. They should have at least gotten to meet. They should have at least been, like, a 90-second hug. That should have happened. Maybe it happened off screen. They should should hug and then fade to black because Robert Jordan does not do porn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, that's what happens in my head. Polyamorous with Gareth and the Tom hanging out? Well, pff, yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? Um, so do we want to talk about men and Loghain and, and their story also? Yeah, I feel bad for men. <laughs> She's just dragged along until she reunites with everybody at the, like, in Saladar. She's just dragged along. The poor girl. Just imagine with all these mopey people. Oh. <laughs> I love Min so, so much. She has such the fuzzy end of the lollipop, this whole freaking book. Yeah, like Mary said, she's the awkward third wheel in this book. But I love her because she's one of the only people that holds her own without magic to back her up. Yeah, she just is. She just is throughout the entire series. And she is also a solid constant, which I appreciate. She's that NPC the DM throws in when the players are like f- floundering, like they don't know what to do, they don't know who <laughs> to turn to, and um, the players like need someone to help them. So that's that's what Min does. She's she's there at the most opportune moments when everyone like when whoever needs to get out of a situation that they can't get out of themselves. And then Logan, man, he is just like, are you gonna die or not? This book. <laughs> He doesn't do anything in this book. I mean, later we can say a lot about Loghain, but in this book, he's, yeah. I mean, he's he's a husk of a person. and he He's, this is the lowest, like he thought he was at his lowest for like the preceding few months, right? This is his actual lowest of lows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then 
things happen, but this is this is the book that sets you up to be like, how much lower can this guy go before something happens? I mean, the politicking of Saladar is like in so many ways kicked off by Swan showing up with Loghain, right? Like yeah. Swan showing up without Loghain would have been a very, very different Saladar plot. Yeah. And we as readers seeing these, you know, very sparse viewings and then has of him and his glory or whatever's to come keeps it intriguing enough, you know, because otherwise it is just like, okay, dude, we get it. You're depressed. You lost your power. You're in withdrawal. I get it. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just a lot of a lot of feelings on the other spectrum to deal through or to deal with. What what Leia just mentioned, if you what, uh, look at it from a plot or the pattern or whatever standpoint, Loghain being as re unresponsible as he was m uh, just made Gareth Brynn follow the girls, get to Saladar, lead the army. So mm -hmm. his fuck-ups were very much needed. <laughs> that could be the tavern for this whole series. The fuck-ups were needed. <laughs> They all land in Saladar, as you mentioned, and um, there's politicking, and I love it so much. Take it away, because I don't get politics. <laughs> no, I mean, just the, the, the whole Saladar storyline is maybe. the, the This and uh, Elaine in the White Tower as a prisoner are my two favorite uh, storylines. I don't know why. For this, this part of the book and the Saladar everything was way more frustrating for me to read than the circus stuff ever was. Just seeing all of these, like, these six chicks on their high horses, on their on their couches, basically trying to direct everything around them without any actual experience always just drove me mental. Especially when you have all these, like they literally have these resources ride into camp, like Swan and Leanne and then the Supergirls, like they ride into camp to them, find them to, I mean, essentially offer their help and support and be there as resources. And those six are just like, well, but maybe. <laughs> but that's, that's, I think that's actually what I love about it. Like these, they are so stale and so stagnant and like Aja, uh, partly. So they're not successful. And then the people come out from, come in from the outside and like, like little agents of chaos and pushing here and pushing there. And Swan, most of all, like pulls her strings in the background and slowly gets them to move. And I like, I really like it. I, I like the nitty gritty that gets on there. I like it as well. It just infuriated me because like for me, like these are, supposedly smart, intelligent, powerful women. And you would think they would use as many resources that they had at hand. And Swan is one of those. Leanne is one of those. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's super dumb. They they are so dumb. Then even Elaine are one of those. Like, just utilize them. You are the White Tower. Well, you're agents of the White Tower, essentially. Use your powers. Like, use them. I don't under... I've just never understood that aspect Because of they're it. moping. Yeah, they're butthurt at being <laughs> broken from the they're tower, moping. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, if, if you're already broken, why not try and forge ahead as best as you can and use the tools at hand, which to me are these people that literally rode into camp to find you. There's there's also a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance happening there. Like, it can't be that the tower is broken. It can't be that someone is still and still trying to get us to act. And Yeah. Yeah. And change change is a hard thing for a lot of people. You have a tower that's been together for thousands of years and all of a sudden broken. It's hard to adapt. That's uh, a lot of the problem Egwene has later that they don't want to they don't want to start the war really because that would mean acknowledging that the tower is broken, which they really really don't want to. Yeah, but ignoring a problem doesn't make it any less real, which always also drove me crazy about this. Like you keep <laughs> deferring something that clearly has obviously happened. You're in Saladar for a reason, right? Like it's broken. You are there because it's broken. So now adapt or die, basically, and. It's just, it used to just drive me, yeah, it drove me nuts. <laughs> In case you haven't noticed. Uh, super Skylik just said, these women are super stillophobic. And yes, they are. <laughs> yeah. Which, and another point too, um, is something that I was kind of, like Swan being hesitant to let Nynaeve study her. Like what's, I never understood what the harm was in studying. I know they have their own negotiations, negotiations and little plots where they kind of discuss with each other, like how to get the one up, but... If I was Swan, there's no harm in somebody trying to study me to make me potentially channel again, even if I think it's never going to happen. I think she, I think she doesn't, she doesn't think that there is a potential. I think it's, she is completely com convinced that it's absolutely hopeless. And so someone else saying, no, you might have hope just hurts every single time. Yeah. yeah. It, I think that mirrors how Swan and Leanne both approached 
their transformations of being still like Leanne's like, I'm going to find opportunities. I'm going to try new things. Like I can handle hope, which is why Leanne wants Mm -hmm. Nynaeve to heal her. She's excited for that. And Swan's like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and not look up out of the rut, not hope. But then she, of course, like breaks down crying, like in Nynaeve's arms when she gets the power back. Like she clearly wanted it. She just couldn't let herself hope. Yeah. And she wants to move on from the trauma. Which is a good point, too, because if you've gone through something awful, you don't want somebody to keep bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up over and over again. Right. It's like Nynaeve, Nynaeve, Nynaeve puts her finger into the wound, <laughs> the wound every time. Yeah. Uh, Super Sky, like, she starts crying at the death of her warder, but she's also crying in Nynaeve's arms. Like, she grabs her in a hug and is, like, sniffling. The, the bawling, the full face bawling is over her warder, like, ten minutes later. And Elida is beginning her reign of terror and incompetence. I like that line. I, I like that description. <laughs> that is accurate. <laughs> I really like Elida as a character. She's such a delightfully competent incompetent, if that makes any sense. And her her descent her descent into madness is so quick. It's like every time we check back in with her, she has gone to another level of crazy. Like nobody can nobody can sit down in my study. No. It's like, what is happening there? Yeah, that talk her and Fane had really uh, amplified her own cray. Her own cray cray. And I, so I was re-listening to the podcast, like, in preparation for today. And I feel like the guys also discussed this. Like, there are signs that she might have been a good leader if times were different. Not if COVID-19 was going around, but maybe there was. (laughs) Maybe during... If she'd come to this in a in a different way, also because she starts from this idea of I have to really fight, I have to fight, fight, fight. Everybody's against me, and she never just sits back and thinks about, okay, I'm leader now. What do I do? She's always in this fight mentality. Yeah, she's not a bad administrator necessarily. In the beginning, later she's just backshit crazy. She was like the counselor to the Queen of Andor for decades. Like she clearly had some skills. But I think there's the the comment that Fane makes that people who are harder to bend are easier to break. I think that she embodies that, like, to a T. Yeah, it's like a live branch versus a dead branch, right? I think she would have been a terrible leader anyways, but who knows? Well, because she, she's just, she would constantly be trying to overcome people and power trip over them, basically, instead of work with people. You know, she's very much power heavy, not negotiate and compromise heavy. Right. Leaders need a good mix of all of it. She probably would have been an excellent, like, battle commander in a protracted war against the Shan Chan. But oh. somebody was a dumbass and got captured by them instead. So <laughs> that didn't work out. But she would have been an amazing, ruthless leader against the Shan Chan. If she had, you know, been like, okay, you know, Egwene, you can dream the future. Tell me where to kick some ass and I will kick it very hard. Well, she ends up with the, with the Shan Chan, doesn't she? Yes, she does. <laughs> Just not quite not the way. Not necessarily in a possession, no. Yeah. Yeah, and she and like the whole part where she's like selling out the other Aes Sedai. She's like, I'll trade you 20 women if you'll just let me go. It's like, wow, you're a shitty leader. Sacrificing your people to get your freedom back. I mean, I get it. Being a Shan Shan prisoner is like a whole thing, but still, bad leader. Yeah. Willing to sacrifice lives to be a good leader? What? <laughs> Who, who are we talking about? <laughs> Not relevant Dude. in the current political situation at all. At Do all. we poke the bear? Do we poke the bear? No, 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 we don't. We don't. <laughs> okay. I, I, I don't feel like that's that's not an opinion I want to air at all. Yeah. Nope. Works for me. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> you can just hear in the pauses everybody would have to say something but everyone holds like, their I'm breath no, yeah no, i'm not no those, those are inside thoughts <laughs> yeah yeah these are this side of the pond thoughts so attack on ravin thunderbolts and lightning very very frightening death oh why did why did she do that <laughs> i'm sorry oh. i was gonna say how do you guys think it would have gone if the fight hadn't been taken to tar bad for Camelin. So much collateral damage. Like, I don't understand how there isn't shit tons of collateral damage already. Like, Ravin does not seem to be the kind of person who would have told the population to bail from the inner city, and he smashes the fuck out of the inner city. 
Like, Nynaeve wouldn't have been there to help Rand to corner him, to corner Ravine. And, like, I think the whole Rand even entering Teleron Riyadh was a huge surprise factor in itself. So, yeah, I just, I wonder at the implication of how it would have gone otherwise. Fuck, yeah. Yeah, Rand wouldn't, Rand was losing that battle until Nynaeve gave him an edge. That would not have happened. She's halfway around the world from him. Well, a quarter of the way around the world from him. Yeah, that would have probably been the end. So which means that Ravine was a dumbass by saying, I don't want to ruin Camelin, like kick it into the dream world. Like he, that was him spelling his own doom. Yeah, he shot himself in the foot doing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they just enter the tar version of the palace and that's it. Okay. Because Nynaeve travels there too. Yeah. Or goes there in the dream world to kind of explore and see what's going on. And she pops in on this situation basically at the same time. Why does Nynaeve end up there? Did she bat us? Because Mogedian spills info about it. Right, right. She's like, the battle is happening today. And Nynaeve's like, well, fuck that shit. We're going to go observe or something. Yeah, we need to go check out what's <laughs> happening. And she just happens to be there when Rand enters. I wonder how much of that is like the timing of Teleron Riyadh, like Tavirining them to be there at the same time. Because <laughs> time flows differently. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something uh, similar happens in the last battle with Perrin, right? That he gets there, right? Yeah, Perrin and Slayer bouncing through, but that's them using their like mental ability to flip back and forth through the worlds. Whereas this is no, no, no. My, I meant, I meant that Perrin is there. No, it's not the last battle. It's the uh, veins of gold that Perrin is there when Rand has a thing. When when Rand is showing up in Teleron Riyadh because he's having such a pivotal moment that like right, man- yeah, and he has to witness bear witness with the wolves and it's oh right yeah i want i also yeah wonder if if parent being there somehow helped that that moment or if he just had to witness i don't know leo makes a good point um he is tavern tavern so him just being there i mean it can't just be just there to witness right like it has to be more than that <laughs> true mm-hmm. true to in one place means something more yeah. is happening. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when when the when him and when Ran and Matt are in the tower together, not the not the White Tower, the other one, which I can't pronounce, the snakes and foxes oh, tower. The Tower of Genji. Yeah, and like it starts like there's like the ground starts heaving and you know floor is lava and all that stuff. So right. Oh, that's not in the <laughs> tower. That's in the their worlds. But yeah, in their worlds. Yeah. yeah. The what what do they call it? It's Neverland in the old tongue. I remember that much. I remember it translates as Neverland. Sindal. Yeah, I think it's it has to be pronounced Shindal. Oh, Shindal. Okay. The, I think so because the she, which is uh, spelled very similarly, is the uh, Celtic fairies. Oh, okay. Cool. Oh, cool. Of course, I, I always brought my Yankee pronunciation to it. It's like Sindal. <laughs> <laughs> Sindal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think, but it's it's a it's a theme through the books that during the the, the big climaxes that different storylines come together and sometimes it works be- just because of Teleron Riyadh because the people are actually spread out over the world but in the climax they all do something together so it's a nice plot device to type everything back in <laughs> I feel like the, the boys mentioned that they don't think they have much to say about Dumai's Wells because battle scenes and <laughs> I think we're the same way so I hope that if they get to, if you get to that point that you get someone on who can talk about battles in a coherent way like i think leia mentioned that she has a lot to say about tactics and ethics and all the great things and it would be very helpful to me to finally understand what's happening there so a, a do my wells patreon episode we have a request set <laughs> yeah no 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 just when they get there in yeah. the regular of, it is known episode. Yeah. honestly it could merit a patreon episode just the battle i think so during the uh the battle at carrion was Samuel present or did he just show up to blow the tower up later on so, yeah so i'm kind of backstepping before the attack of ravin i guess ravine how do you guys say his name ravin I, I say ravin ravine i say ravin as well i say ravine who cares yeah it doesn't matter i look into the pronunciation thing uh-huh. i have said so ravin stuck in my head like <laughs> You know how he says it every time this when when this chapter was being discussed. Mm-hmm. So, Ravin then I guess work can't help you. He's not in the glossary of this book. Oh no! What? Which doesn't make any sense. No, it's Ranch Rook Ruidian. Yeah. So at the Battle of Carrion, their tower gets destroyed right towards the end of the battle. Right. Once they start realizing that the 
you know, the tides are starting to turn. And like, I would have thought Samuel would have been there the whole time, but it feels like he just shows up to destroy the tower that Egwene and Avi and Rand are on. Once he starts to see that things are starting to shift a little bit for his side for the worse. Can anybody else, like, do you guys think that's also what happened? Because I feel like if, wouldn't Samael have wanted to be there earlier to kind of destroy what was going on? Because he can also feel the sense of where Rand is channeling from and where the girls are channeling from. Or where Rand is channeling from anyways. Wouldn't he have wanted to take that tower down from the get-go instead of towards the end after so many of his, so many lives on his side had already been lost? Do we know where he is when this is happening? I assume that Samael was also just watching from afar. Maybe... I feel like Samael's the one that's described as being willing to sacrifice any amount of his own resources to get his ends, yep. right? Yes. So yes. I could see him wanting to let Rand tire himself out before kicking him in the balls, which would mean letting a lot of his army get wrecked, burning up Rand's strength. Seems like a forsaken thing to do. Mm-hmm. Because Rand is, like, way less capable of surviving that fall and being an effective leader after the fall because he was, like, already on the brink of being exhausted. Instead of taking that at the beginning. Yeah. And he like almost like burned himself out from losing the source with the impact, right? Like that wouldn't have happened if he'd been on top of this game. But when he's already tired, like he might have burned himself out there. Kangus Khan, or however you say his name, just said that Napoleon Bonaparte is a good parallel for him visually. But Napoleon wasn't short. (laughs) No, yeah, that's a myth. It was actually propaganda, which I think is funny. Like somebody, somebody in in England said, oh, "The dude is small," and here we are, hundreds of years later, like, "Oh, the dude is so small." <laughs> wow, I love that. I knew it was a myth, but I didn't know it was an actual piece of propaganda. <laughs> it was an actual piece of propaganda. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was. Uh, he was five eight, but at this time, he was actually among the taller people. Right, five eight back then would have been much more impressive than it is now. <laughs> On the tall end of normal, I think. I mean, 5'8 is still average. I think Samuel... I, I, may, well, maybe... Oh, no, Seth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're just born in the wrong century, Seth. You you, you would, you, you are an inner giant. But do we know... Is Samuel actually short? Or is he just a little shorter than Luz Theron, which makes him think that he's super short and has to overcompensate? I think he's just a little bit shorter. He's the one who resents that the power couldn't make him taller, right? It's just so he could overtop Rand. I just wonder if he if he's actually, like short or if he just in his head thinks he should be much much taller i I would bet so given that he puts so much emphasis on measuring up to rand who's like you know 75 feet tall or whatever (laughs) (laughs) yes samuel is the samuel is the master of overcompensation seriously no i'm not going there (laughs) (laughs) another one of those pauses where it's like drives a really "Mm -hmm." big truck (laughs) we have one of those monster trucks Oh my god, yes. He would totally be the guy that gets out of the truck that is dwarfed by its tires. Well, it's funny. That's that's where you go. Because here we would go to, like, loud sports cars for this. No, that too. Yeah. And in America, it really because helps we, if it pollutes. Because there are no big trucks here. <laughs> because you you would get stuck in streets. I envy your city designs that were not built for cars. Where have we gone? Uh, I... I'm down to the bye bye Lanfear, Moraine, Raven, Asmodian. Some of them even stay dead. <laughs> Comment. <laughs> I love these notes. This is so good, Anna. So good. <laughs> yeah, it's really. Some of even, them even stay dead. Yay. Who, who stays dead? Raven stays dead. Asmo- right. oh, Asmodian stays dead. Asmodian, they both stay dead. Asmodian yes. stays dead. Yeah. The guys stay dead. The girls come uh, back because women are... Because they get bailfired. Because that's the only way of ever getting rid of someone. Oh, bailfire or like Martian gin thingy. Yeah. Do we have a no. theory on who killed Asmodian? Or... <laughs> There's no theory. It was Grandal. It's wrong. I don't care. It was Grandal. I mean, the theory is she's responsible for his death. So take that as whatever you want to take it as. I have to say, I never actually cared. It was like, yeah, somebody killed him. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> so you were the yeah, least yeah, impressive I Forsaken. I don't even care who killed you. <laughs> no, Get no, your fancy him. pants out of here. You're I'm, just I'm, dead. I, I was actually <laughs> sad that he died because I think that uh, that it, it was interesting with him around. He had a cool redemption arc possibility that was not actualized. Yeah. Yeah. And And I think it would have been... If he'd stayed uh, around, he would never have gotten the real redemption arc because his his heart was never in it. He was just a opportunist <laughs> to the nth degree. Yeah, that's true. I mean, he would he would never have uh, d- done the the sacrifice thing that you 
need in fantasy to have the ultimate redemption arc, yeah right? he would have failed at the last he would have frodoed out at the last minute no matter how much he talked himself up yeah and, <laughs> and i would have and i would have liked that <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah this comic in discord for the non-live people it's the uh asmodian looking frustrated because there's a speech bubble that says and uh looks at smudge writing on hand musician musician <laughs> the dark lord is like uh yes yeah, so i've got the betrayer of hope and the mistress of pain and the uh musician, musician. <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's 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 not it's not the best reason for becoming the ultimate evil guy that you want to play music better than everybody it's just... it, okay but it does make me think of amadeus the movie <laughs> i mean that that's the the, the dude right there like if he had the chance to swear his soul to the dark one to take down mozart he totally would have Poor done it Salieri. he never was like that <laughs> cardi b is forsaken <laughs> just not nearly as loud <laughs> I, I i like plot point wise i think he's in there because they needed a sort of a non-threatening forsaken who could like teach rand yeah he needed the basics. He needed someone to teach him the basics before he... Someone someone needed to teach Ran. Um, and they needed like a neutral-ish Forsaken who could do it because it needed to be magic from that time, like before the breaking. Right. And all the other males have like very personal grudges against Rand, so... <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. Like he's the most non-threatening, ambiguous... But yeah, I think he was the only one of them who could have been any kind of teacher towards Rand. Is everybody else sad that he never meets Tom? Because I think there would have been a grudge. Ooh. Epic rap battles of history. <laughs> Tom versus Oh my Asmodian. god. <laughs> Just harping away. Dun dun dun. Tom would so kick his ass though. I mean. Yeah, Tom's way more of a polymath. He's the real Renaissance man. <laughs> Death harp do <duo. laughs> Totally. I'm with Patrick dun, dun, there. Tom. Tom so wins. Tom totally. That would be the best rap battle video. Yeah. By far. Realistically. <laughs> Tom couldn't win because if you have like centuries to practice, probably was good. But did Asmodian practice or did he just murder people? <laughs> wow. No, he was actually a, com a composer. Fair point. I think he was good. Yeah. I think he was good. He just killed anyone who was better. Yeah. Yeah. That that is one way to be the best. By that lo by that logic, he he would have had been to be at least a little bit good because otherwise everybody else would be dead. And nobody knew what music was. So. <laughs> nobody knows what music was. Yeah. <laughs> right? Wasn't there this movie recently about the, like, somebody, is this, uh, suddenly everybody forgot what the, who the Beatles were? Yesterday? One guy? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I watched that trailer. Like, I never watched that movie, but I that's, saw that. And that's a, that's Asmodian's thing, right? Nobody knows how music sounds except me. So however bad I do it, everybody will love me. I, I read one, one that review and then i didn't want to anymore which is probably dumb i'm not really a beatles fan so i was like eh. oh i'm a big beatles fan <laughs> though i did I, I have recently occasionally put on some beatles and be like this isn't actually as bad as i thought it was but you know when your parents are obsessed with something it takes a while we have they have the big the big um let's say red door in the room of <laughs> two other people who who die which is probably a good segue into our Going forward, what does this mean? It's, what does this book mean for the later story point? Because the fact that Moraine leaves changes a lot. Yeah. I was just wondering if Rand ever adds Moraine's name to his list. I can't remember right now. Yes. Yes. He does, right? Yeah. He's such a weirdo. Even if he's near someone when they die, he's just like, yep, that name's going on my list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and her loss is really big for more than just Rand, right? Like, this changes the relationship of, of the Supergirls to the White Tower, right? This happens at this virtually the same time as Swan is deposed. Like, there's a huge amount of shakeup in, like, the Aes Sedais and the, the novices' acceptance relationship to each other, starting with the deposition and ending with the red door frame. It's like, and all your good guys are gone. <laughs> It also, in my opinion, changes the whole dynamic of the books because before that you had you had the innocent farm boys and you had Maura Rain who knew every, everything come in and lead them into this world and explain everything. And now she's gone and they are the ones who, who figure it out by themselves. There's no layer above them. Right, right it's, it's a Dumbledore thing. Like she has to go for them to, for them to fully actualize their potential because she'd be a security blanket. But it's also... 
from a from a narrative narrative standpoint it's there's nobody left who knows more than the people in whose heads we are all the time so you guys know the hero's journey right the yes yeah so like although with wheel of time because of how many characters there are and how large it is i feel like there's many variations of the hero's journey going on simultaneously with different characters but and like for a while ran even things tom died when he loses the um, like when him and matt are traveling with tom when right when he fights the murdral yes exactly um so that that was like point 1 version of the death of the um what's it called let me just google the actual image so that i can find the and then this was the bigger one this was like the main where moraine dies and that like that uh, decides his him going into the next arc right mhm yeah because it really motivates him because now he doesn't have anyone he can like go to for advice like he was about ready to trust her with asking for advice and now nope you are the adult in the room around sorry always uh super impressed by how she managed to from these weird visions that you get in Ruidian how she managed to have this tactic that she impl- that she gets him to trust her by being this observant person stuff that she gets this from this vi- these visions i don't know how that works yeah i think she like sees like the the snapshot of like the bracelet landfear the doorway rand kneeling so like She's like, okay, how can I set everything up so that way, like, that snapshot happens? That's that's also true, but I meant before how she manages to get him to trust her by completely changing everything Yeah. about herself, basically. Well, she remembered how to um, how to control Sidar, so... Yeah, that's true. I mean, at least that's how she justifies yeah, okay, it to she, herself. She, she, knew, she knew the concept. That's true. Oh, this is a nice graphic that Nin... I don't know if I've ever actually seen this before. I, like, I know what the hero's journey yeah. is, but I've never seen this graphic. There's many versions of it of course. There's a Lord of the Rings version, you know. You can find it for specific books as well, but I think this is the basics of it. And like I find this fascinating once you've seen it, you just can't not see it especially in like fantasy books. I I see it everywhere whether it be Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings was of course the trend setter. Mhm. I also like this graphic is in a wheel form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, cyclical makes me happy. I have put in the Google Doc two quotes about Moraine, which I really like. Maybe somebody else would like to read them for once. I'll read one of them. Uh, oh, this is a good one. This is one by her and one about her. Yeah, so I'll, re- I'll read the one that's by her because it's a good one. We have made the world dance as we sang for 3,000 years. That is a difficult habit to break, as I have learned while dancing to your song. You must dance free. Even the best intentioned of my sisters may well try to guide your steps as I once did. Yeah, that's her entire lesson that she learns, like, at the 11th hour. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have to say, Aradia, you've learned to read so well by doing your podcast. Thank you. If I remember your first episode, and now it's progressed really nicely. <laughs> Appreciate that. She was a soldier, a warrior in her ways as much as I. This could have happened 200 times these past 20 years. She knew it, and so did I. It was a good day to die. Oh, well, shivers. Yeah, the whole it was a good day oh, to yeah. die is like oh, mm-hmm. oh that's so true. It goes it goes back again to the whole you must let people take credit for their own choices. Yeah, of of all the thousands of times it could have happened, this was the day that it happened and you just have to accept it. And it was a good time for it to have happened. And not just accept it, not just accept it, but let them have this. It's not yours to it's not yours to give, it's not yours to deny she did this because it was what she wanted to do basically and lan could accept it lan has dedicated his entire life to protecting her and he's like nah she was a soldier it's okay he he was he was fine with it at first and then he bitched out hard about nanif to rand and i was so mad about that that was a sad he did not respond well to that but he at least accepted maureen's agency <laughs> he did mm-hmm. he did but then he went and uh, he, he he went and said well no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't ever love anyone. Bye. What a dude! What? Oh my goodness. He was. But... He was such. A, <laughs> no, he was such a great mentor to Rand all the time. Every everything he said to him was was great and wise and good. And then his parting words were just so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but which is human, but still, duck. It's very human. It's very much the stone kind of breaking a bit, right? He is such a a stone faced stone warrior kind of man. He's never been. 
seen from our perspective yet to have really any emotion of any kind, except for little snippets we see of his conversations with Nynaeve when they're traveling. And even then it's very like cold trying to ignore his emotions and feelings and try to do the right thing by whatever he thinks the right thing is. So this is him literally his emotions breaking through. Yeah, like I'm really with Seth on this. He he knows how he's feeling right now about Moraine's death and he really doesn't want Nin to feel um Nynaeve to feel um how he's feeling. Like I know. And, and there's a reason why like, you know, doctors and therapists aren't supposed to operate or, you know, work with their family members. Like it's different when emotions are involved. Like he was mm-hmm. he was never in love with Moraine. They were close, they were good friends, they were, you know, partners, but it's it's easier to be separated from it versus when you're in love with someone. When emotions get involved, there's just another level that gets added to it, right? That's why mm-hmm, he resisted. Yeah. That's why he resisted Nani for all this time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like the whole, I don't want to dress you in widow's black and stuff. By the way, I just wanted to look something up and I realized, did you know that the chapter where Moraine tackles uh, Lanfear is called Choices? I never put... Ooh. Oh, oh. <laughs> interesting nice because yeah the sorry guys you probably mentioned that but i didn't hear because it's about the fact that rand essentially had already made his choices and moraine is like i'm gonna choose around your choices for you and the whole concept of choice and agency and yeah that's Mm -hmm. good job rj good job Mm -hmm. did you guys also know that the chapter title leave takings chapter 48 also appears in the three earlier books, Eye of the World and the Great Horns and Shadow Rising. What? Yeah. yeah. No. Yes. I, re- I realized that at some point, like, there's another leaf taking chapter. There are very, very few chapter headings that appear throughout the series. The leaf takings happens in four of the books. Wow. Um, I never noticed that. Yeah. Super Skylake says that he thinks Harriet is the one responsible for the chapter and titles. Oh. Well, in that case, good job, oh. Harriet. So, <laughs> Yeah. Bambi, I have them all listed here. Leave takings happens in Eye of the World in chapter 10 when they all leave the two rivers. They're all running. Then leave takings happens in The Great Hunt, chapter 9, when they're leaving the borderlands after the Merlin had. Um, Mer- a Merlin? A Merlin? That's how I say it in my head. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, had come to Faldara and tries to take them away. Um, so they leave the borderlands. And then chapter 16 of The Shadow Rising, Egwene goes to the waste and Perrin goes into the ways. Wow. So, so in the two books before, it's always when the party breaks up. Yeah, it's always when parts of the party breaks up, or part of our right. super super team basically is splits off to go on an adventure. So yeah, in Fire's Heaven, chapter forty eight, leave takings is when Nynaeve leaves the circus. Nynaeve and Elaine leave the circus and do that on the okay. boat. So yeah, it's just I. So this is this is a party splitting one, right? Because Moraine goes off to to Shindal, and and Lan goes off to. Saladar and Ran goes all over the place. Mm. <laughs> goes to pieces. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. He's so all over the place. I, I, yeah, when I saw the leave takings title in chapter 48 of Fires of Heaven, I'm like, I've, you've seen this word. Like, I've seen this before. I've read this before. And then, yeah, turns out it's also the chapter heading out those other three chapters. Just thought that was a really kind of cool takeaway. Excellent Easter egg finding. Yeah. <laughs> Rand goes on a leave taking of his sanity. Thank you, Super Yeah, it, exactly, Seth. Yeah, it's one of the episode titles as well for the show, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> leave taking of his sanity. Yes, Super Sky Lake. Um, I also kind of, if you guys wanted to, I had some notes about Avienda Ooh. from oh, yeah, Fires of please. Heaven as well. Because I think I mentioned it. We have it. not mentioned her here. Her no, igloo. I'm so sorry. Wow. I, I completely forgot it's about that. No, queen. that's okay. <laughs> oh my god, yes, I can't I've, believe we just skipped all over it. it. I mean, there's a lot of shit to cover in the tangents. So. <laughs> <laughs> but the igloo <laughs> cannot be left off. <laughs> that happens if somebody makes notes and everybody's like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. yeah. <laughs> One of the more recent live recordings uh, that I was present for, I can't remember what the situation was, but I had mentioned in the chat that Avienda really acts like a girlfriend to both Egwene and Rand throughout, well, Fires of Heaven and like towards the end of the last book as well. You know, Mm -hmm. she's kind of not the middleman between the two, but she acts like a support person and a girlfriend to both of them in different ways throughout the entire book, which I think is a huge plot arc for her. Two romantic relationships, basically. And they happen to have one with each other as well. She's the hinge. Yeah. I think that's the word for it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That sounds fun. I always liked reading 
reading their relationship as reading Avi and Egwin, I've always thought that they were totally like dating friends. Oh, like yeah. th- that's just it's, oh, yeah. it's yeah. a thing. They become such good friends yeah. so quickly, and there's jewelry exchanges and like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and Egwin. So, I mean, like the first sister ceremony is so much like a wedding. Yeah. Hmm. Just a bit more juicy. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> ah. <laughs> More juicy than a wedding. <laughs> it's it's for me it's really weird talking about about uh Elena Navienda right now because I always keep thinking back on the first sister ceremony that we did because I mean basically Faron is my Avienda because I'm of course not the warrior in this. <laughs> <laughs> well it's just it's so intriguing because at the beginning of the book, like a Gwen goes into Avienda's dreams almost by accident and sees her nightmares about Rand. Right, so we go from an Avienda at the beginning of Fires of Heaven having literal nightmares about Rand because she isn't really allowed to process her feelings or emotions about him in real life. She has to be almost a stone warrior as well. All of this emotion and feeling towards Rand and her responsibility to Elaine is coming out in dream form, and Egwene sees that, so that almost grows their bond too in a way because Egwene's like, "Oh my God, Avienda's terrified of him," and this makes me wonder, like, was Avienda? you know, Fizz, like, really terrified of a man who can channel as well. Like, is that something that was maybe in her head for her terror? Or was it all just fighting her own love and emotions for her? I don't think it was the channeling. I feel like she just brushes that off at one point. Yeah. Just like, eh, no, it's it's my, my own toe that's really causing kittens. <laughs> yeah, I think so, too. Because he's just, he's the car car and he is what he is. And I think she accepts that very matter-of-factly, but... Yeah, I, don't, I just thought it was interesting that at the beginning of the book, we, we see a little bit of her emotional inner turmoil going on through her dreams, which we don't ever see from a reader's perspective in when she's in real life. Yeah, I, th- I think she's way more, she's very much like a, a dude. She's way more scared of her emotions than she is of dying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very ideal thing. She has, she has very, very strict, a very strict image of what she should be, what she should want in life, what she should feel, and again, has a lot a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance about what happens with her and her whole honor class is really hard her her teaching elaine Giotto later makes her reevaluate where she might earn g in different ways i love that process that arc of her, like right it's when great. you teach you learn the thing better like and i yeah. yell teaching yes. Giotto to a wetlander that can actually start to get it like totally deepens her own understanding which is awesome yeah, and yeah, and she she actually starts with her idea of maiden Giotto, which doesn't apply to her anymore, and it's a really hard process for her that her whole maiden training does not apply to her anymore. It coincides, of course, with her becoming a wise one and going through this process, which has to be sped up, which makes it even harder, which makes it take longer, and yeah. Yeah, I agree with what Amy said earlier as well. Um, Egwene is too conservative for Avi and her his relationship to be anything more than just emotional support, basically. Like, when I say Avienda is a girlfriend to the both, she's definitely emotional support to Egwene, kind of guiding her through the IEO culture and teaching her about, you know, this is dealing with picking up rocks and putting them in different piles. Like, <laughs> she kind of guides her through the aspects of that. If you've run 50 t- if you run naked 50 times around a tent, your friends, yeah, around the camp, your friends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I wonder if... Con- conservatism in this world is different enough from what we would understand as conservatism that that inhibition wouldn't have been there i don't know that she even needed it though ogain was very focused like she gets her hair braided and a week later she's like fuck the system so yeah yeah but at the at the same time to, uh, just the mention of sister wives make them make them run screaming for the hills oh okay okay that's good i still do think that they have an emotional bond that's like would build to romance totally. like, it's that intimate they care that much for each other but yeah i agree probably it did not physically become lovership but yeah she's doing up on gallon <laughs> plus like avi is you know a little bit has a lot on else on her mind so but they they go through a lot of physical trials and tribulations together so there's some bonding there's some bonding of course i mean for the for the longest time avienda refers to Egwene as her near sister right like, mm-hmm. she watches rand for the friend of her near sister. Right. I was actually very surprised later on when her and Elaine decide to become near sisters. I mean, it makes sense. They're they're going to be sharing yeah. Rand and all that. But originally, it did feel like Avi was closer to Egwene than she yeah. was. Yeah, she was. She absolutely was, yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Like we don't get as much build up. We don't know when that happens, but at some point Elaine becomes more important to her. It's so much of their relationship is super off screen and I hate it because it's I love the relationship that comes out of it and I wish we could see it build. Yeah, I mean, I mean if this bathtub scene would just be <laughs> <laughs> more bathing we'd all be happy right yeah. surely the water is the point of this story <laughs> like she never gets time with men either and then their relationship makes total sense later when they're so awkward around each other don't really know each other but they're like okay i guess we got to deal with each other <laughs> but they never show when and how she gets close but it's beautiful yeah a lot of man bashing in the background it's beautiful it is yeah yeah. Jesus! Anyway. Praise Jesus. Jesus has come to us. <laughs> it's just after Easter. What do you imagine? Yes. <laughs> Jesus has risen. The next thing I thought was interesting in the going forward list was that this is the last that we see of accepted Egwene. And I thought that was a really cool observation into her transformation in this. Like, aside from all this emotional stuff she's going through, changing friendships and continents and all of that. But, well, not continents, land masses. But you're right. This is the last of... Egwene transitioning into being like from being an accepted into being a sister even though she doesn't quite know it yet she's acting the sister part already basically yeah she just needs the title now yeah next time we'll see her she'll be pretty much on her way to being Amerlin and every and she changes everything changes rapidly from there in her story like until now she's basically basically tagged along with whatever group was there where she could learn she likes that we've talked a lot I think about how she is so good at adapting to every culture she encounters. And that's what... Yeah, we basically just see her as a driving force this entire time. Yeah, right. And I think this this uh, this thing has now ended. Like, she absorbed all this, learned all this. And now, and the next time we see her, she puts it all to use. She still learns from Swan, of course, but she gets way more agency going forward. She basically trial runs the uh, accepted exchange program that she proposes later. She goes and spends like all these months studying with the Aiel as an accepted. It's a shame that she never entered a um, Windfinder ship that was yeah. Elaine. Oh, she would have been so epic to see. It should have been her, actually, from a narrative standpoint, but doesn't didn't didn't work basically. Yeah, I like how she takes all of her different avenues of practice that she's gone through so far and puts it all into a nice little bundle. Yeah, <laughs> right. I think she also uses what she learns here with the Aiel when she gets. Um kidnapped by the tower and put to work as a novice mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and beaten all the time and beaten all the time but she is so calm and she like in her head when we read her point of views we know what's going on in her head but everyone else is like is seeing the amaryllin and they even start calling her that even though she is working in the kitchens right like something like that happens well it's a perfect example of leading by example right she's not showing that she's getting broken She's showing confidence. The dining, and... the dining hall scenes, Bambi, right? Where the novices start coming to her because she doesn't sit down on the pillow. Damn. Yes. Yeah. She learns yeah. all of that yeah. strength of will from the IO. It's it's such a tiny thing that she that somebody brings her the pillow, which already shows that somebody is defer, deferring it to her, and she said nope. And I think she learns that here, right, with all the punishment that the IO makes. Yes. Her. Yeah. Yeah. Novice training never would have gotten her yeah. in that place. <laughs> Patrick says they drug her and beat her and she makes them look like fools. That's true. With the juggling the, t- the tiny balls of light. <laughs> oh yeah, she just keeps going. Like, da, 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 da. Yeah, well she's just, she's such a calm, collected what, powerhouse. What, you didn't, you didn't want me to do this? Do you mean you can't do this? But yeah, she was, the tower was, was training her to be breakable and the Aeol made her infinitely bendable instead. I think that's, a, that's one of the quotes I didn't put in there, but I think there's the whole um the will opens in the storm quote is from this book mm. i think it gets brought up a few times but i would not be surprised if this is the book where we get the most looks at it anything else about Egwene? she doesn't do that much in this book i think no she gets set up she goes through training basically. <laughs> no she yeah exactly she she just learns keeps learning from avienda and the aiel and she has her chats with moraine and that's kind of basically we just see her kind of on the periphery of everything yeah, it's her training montage in the background. Yeah. We see her be a bit cruel to her friends a bit. The eye of the dragon playing in the background. Eye of the dragon. I'm sorry. I'm oh, so sorry. Radio. I just got I just got uh, Carithian Rhapsody out of my head and now you're doing this. I'm the thing. worst. I'm the worst. <laughs> don't don't you know that I can't think if I play music? 
behind my ears. Behind my eyes, I mean. Oh, God. Next item on the list of things that change going forward. We invent traveling. That changes. And that just becomes pace. commonplace. That changes the pace of the books and it changes the scope of the books so I wonder much. if RJ invented that because he was like, my timeline and my geography are getting out of control. So, like... <laughs> I can't have people on horses and wagons all the time. Right, Check. this isn't Star Trek. I don't... How do I Navy fix it? transporters. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I love gateways, but they are so overpowered and underutilized. Enter and roll, yeah. <laughs> one of the best things Brandon Sanderson did was get creative. Yeah, <laughs> that's one of the best things Brandon Sanderson brought to the series was freaking Andrew's inventiveness. I mean, it's so Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, that was that was what sold me on Sanderson at all. I'm just like, okay, if he can write this good for Wheel of Time, I guess I'll take a spin through his other stuff. Of course, they could be even more effective, yeah. but it would have broken everything. I mean, a lot of things in the series could have been more effective. Talking is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not be unrealistic. Okay, this is fantasy, not like. <laughs> Why communicate when I can use magic? Traveling in the dream to go scout locations is another one. Like, why didn't they do that with everything, everywhere, to go investigate and spy? Like, if they knew they could get notes from Elena's office that easily? Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you just try and poke around anywhere else? Anywhere else, literally. The gateway, Aja, yeah. It's it's definitely one of the challenges in uh, the Just Roll With It, trying out the fourth age is... Us as as players, we know how underutilized the power was, so we keep coming up with things that never happened in canon mm. that like should have worked. But like, not only is that not helpful, we're also novices. So you get be super overpowered so quickly. We're trying. We try very hard, and and then we get smacked down by the law of God, and it's a thing. But it's definitely a problem because they didn't use the power effectively enough in canon, and we have had all this time to think about it and like engineer better solutions, and it playing without that is like you imagine if swan could dream walk when she was oh my god in seat with that ring like all the places she would have spied like i would have gone to the white cloaks immediately looked up on all their shit going on like i would have gone all over the place all the different thrones if you can i just the fact that you could look at different sheets of paper and find information i would do that every day yeah. all the time she'd probably she'd probably have like standing weaves of tiny tiny gateways to all like offices of heads of states in their closets or something and that she had a room where she go and put her ear to them and listen yeah, to Yeah, it's like Moraine's eavesdropping trick on steroids. Right, like mission know? control. Yeah. Like the Omron <laughs> study is just all of these gateways in like a, you know, boat out wall, like NASA or something. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right? All your numerous monitors, but they're actually literal portals. Yeah. <laughs> right. Fun. She could be a one-woman CIA. If anything, the Green Aja should have been in charge of something like that and utilized it. When I, when I put that in the notes, I just thought about, because I recently started reading the first book again because i tried to make my partner read it i'm failing so badly <laughs> at that but well um and i realized there's so much so many travel chapters so many travel chapters and that it all ends now yeah yeah true. So from from one one minute to the other we go from a lot of traveling to instant wow. travel i had never thought of how big of a watershed technology that is in terms of the narrative yeah the we were just discussing the leave takings chapter and it takes on a whole new note with, with traveling being invented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. You, and then you always need like narrative tactics to limit it, like parent with a dream spike and stuff. Yeah, with all of the catch up time we get for not traveling. It's the same in any any thriller or something that you some, somehow have to keep people from using the internet <laughs> because that would end everything way too quickly. I'm uh, rereading Dresden Files at the moment, and they just solved this by wizards can't use technology, it breaks down. So he can not barely make telephone calls. Mm. <laughs> That's clever. I mean, as a narrative way of adding that conflict. It's, it's, it's not bad. It's also funny because he's in this wizard order where they're all super old, crusty white men. They're not all white, but they're crusty old men. So they would reject the technology anyways, and he would love it, but he can't. Like, he can barely use an elevator he doesn't doesn't have electricity in his house because it breaks down it's actually really intriguing i want to read it yeah you have to you have to power through some very very weird description of women yeah. though he gets better he doesn't get good but he gets better but the beginning is rough i love dressing i love it so much because in the in the beginning it's a like detective noir procedural and then it sneaks an epic fantasy setting on you you don't realize it's happening, but at some point, like in book five or six, you're like, wait, what the, is that been happening the whole time in the background? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it has. That sounds really neat. 
I haven't it's read neat. them either. It's neat. The, the, he, he was starting out with the first ones, and the first ones are not that good. Hmm. But it gets better, and it gets better quickly, and it gets really good. If a little chauvinistic at some time. On the list, <laughs> we are down to the bottle cap comment, which I don't actually have the background to know <laughs> the bottle cap comment means. Oh, yeah. For, yeah, I put that in there. If anyone listens to the Glass Cannon podcast, um, bottle caps are a big deal. So this Anna putting that in there, or Anna putting that in there was pretty funny for me. I said <laughs> that uh, Rand from this point on starts collecting crowns as if they were bottle caps. And that made Kersi laugh. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, as I said that um, he conquered here before, but now he has the Aiel as the first nation that he actually leads. And it's the start of a trend, basically. Right, mm-hmm. he has the hearts and the minds, not just possession of the castle. Right, and um, yeah, from now on, he doesn't leave without owning everything. <laughs> yeah, I walked in, I own, it's a right? thing. Right, yeah, no, no taking a fifth, just take the whole thing. Just take it. He came, he saw, he conquered. And a b- little bit of, uh, yeah, leaving it behind, sort it out, people. Yeah. Doesn't go well every time. No, no, it does not. But yeah, he does He does sort of become incapable of not picking up crowns whenever he goes to Unclaimed Kingdoms. It's like... Right, Emperor Faye is beginning to peek out, as Bambi said. For sure. <laughs> yeah, we've got Darth and Emperor Rand both sort of uh, starting to come out of the wings on this one. It's so Rand, though, playing the game without knowing it. Like, crowns <laughs> just falling into his lap, even though he didn't lift a finger. <laughs> so yeah. Cool. It's the whole game of houses again. Just, it's the game of nations. His unification obsession kind of reminds me of Dalinar a little bit in the Stormlight books. Just um, clap, Ran, just clap. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, dare I say Game of Thrones? I was totally going there. <laughs> <laughs> I was very deliberately not doing that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I love Bambi's comment. The Taviran life chose him. He did not choose a Taviran life. <laughs> the Taviran life chose him. <laughs> Living his best Taviran life. His true Straight self. Out of oh god! Yeah. yeah. Hashtag blessed by the creator. <laughs> Maybe he's born with it. Maybe it's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unite the before the storm. The east and the west has to be one. It's all. Yeah. Oh my god! Yes, you can tell we have crossed the two-hour mark on our recording. <laughs> mm. <laughs> our mm-hmm. brains are starting to short circuit. More, more coffee. Mine is still playing Bohemian Rhapsody, so. What do you have? Which is not helpful for like coherent mm. thoughts. No, it's not a very coherent no. song. But we are almost at the end of our pseudo coherent list, which is cool. <laughs> yes, this list has been very helpful. So I'm very helpful. glad. God, this. we needed a list. <laughs> yeah, the next uh, I had, which um, we have a time. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Nay! E. I hate that. I hate that guy yeah, so he's much. Bad. He's bad. Yeah. But but the storyline he starts with uh, the Black Tower is actually quite intriguing. Oh yeah, time of your life. Yeah, thank you. I the Black Tower was the most disappointing but useful plot device in like the whole series. Like maybe like I think Fane and and the Black Tower were like they they're set up to be this amazing either act, re- opportunity or villain, and then they just kind of like petered out. Yeah. Like, I love Andrew and Pavara taking the Black Tower back, but, like, Rand sets the Black Tower up to be, like, his ace in the hole, and it ends up, like, being almost the reason he fails. Yeah, it was looming in the background so much, and then what was going on there was great. I I, I love the whole storyline of Loghain taking it, and Pavara and Andrew and stuff, but the scope and what it meant for Rand to set it up and then abandon it, mm, yeah, it was not as realized as it could have been. Well, Patrick's bringing up a good question of do we do we think that Tame was was a dark friend on his own power or was he turned by someone? I feel like my vote goes to he went to the dark. I mean he he's been mistreated. I think so too because the light hasn't really treated him well. So exactly like he's not been treated well. Yeah, no, Leah. I didn't mean like turned like with thirteen murder. I just meant like co opted or convinced or did he seek it out and I, I i agree i think he was a kind of ambitious ruthless person that sought it out because he wasn't getting what he wanted out of life mm-hmm. converted right turn. yes yes turn has a very yeah. specific meaning that yeah of his own volition yeah 
and he was captured as well right like i doubt the dead pe- sisters t- t- like uh, treated him very well either seeing how they treated rand mhm those red sisters are so nice he t- uh tame comes in at the end of this book right yeah like the last chapter yeah yeah and so this yeah. is before he was that's why shifted. i put it in there this is before he was shifted to not being demon dread right so a lot of this like initial dialogue has all of that like this has to be a forsaken like the way he says everything and he's yeah, yeah, yeah. He becomes not a forsaken, but at this point in the writing, the way he's set up and introduced is like he gets he gets deforsaken. Yeah, it's like a red herring, but it was out. actually a real thing. <laughs> then it became a red herring. Can we can we uh, agree on calling it a red heron whenever we are we have time talking? I yeah. am super <laughs> yes. okay with that. Red heron. Yep. It's a red heron. Yep. Head cannon established, guys. Take note. Head <laughs> Thank you. Yep, I wanted that. Yeah. The next thing you have is that. There is a very obvious lack of Perrin. Everyone's favorite Wolfie. Is no, but was it obvious? I don't think I noticed until he came he comes back in the next book. I'm like, wait a second, where the hell have you been? Right? I very much noticed because I love Perrin. I love Perrin too, but A lot of these chapters I was waiting for another Perrin reflection. And we never got it. So I very I very much noticed. Exactly, exactly, Sky. Like I I didn't notice on my first read. <laughs> Well, my first read was so long ago that I don't remember now, but I do feel like I remember thinking uh, about, like whenever there's books where there's like very little or no Matt or Perrin, I always notice. Especially yeah. since in the book before this, we had so much of Perrin. Yeah. So in Path of Daggers, we have no Matt and in uh, Crown of Thorns, we'll have no Rand. And we already had almost no Rand in uh, The Ring Reborn, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's from everyone else's point of view except his. Yeah, right. He just he sometimes pops back in and back out again. And I do like the idea that he has a really happy honeymoon off screen that's so drama free that it's like we don't even need to see it. Like just there's a brief happily ever after. <laughs> yeah, I wanted us to speculate what's going on in the two rivers. <laughs> I think he's just trying to reestablish reestablish the area, right? Because the the big Trolloc fight happened, the tr- big Trolloc battle happened, and. His honeymoon time is them establishing themselves, whether he likes right. it or not. It's them establishing okay, what's themselves. Okay, lo- what's Loyal going uh, doing? There are not that many books in the Two Rivers. What's Categorizing the trees in the Two Rivers. If Neil is Chopping any trees. guy, <laughs> then he is cataloging. <laughs> he's doing a in- yeah. I bet he's helping with the he's inventory. He's he's putting his quirkus on, right? Probably telling. I just picture Loyal's. Yeah, he's working on his book, or maybe he's like telling stories to the village children. You know, around a fire at night. That's what I just picture this big, gigantic, fluffy man with a group of kids around him, like doing daycare. He- can we headcanon that the presence of Loyal finally makes the two rivers get like a school system? Yes. Because that would be nice. Oh, he does teach the kids. Okay, Amy. That'd be why it was in my brain then. I, I adore this. So he's works on his books and he sets up formal education. He's a gigantic teddy bear yeah. teacher. Yes, please. Th- this is a thing. I want this. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, of course. And Fayil is basically setting out a government and Perrin is... Yeah, she's doing all the bookwork stuff. Trying not to be in the government. <laughs> yeah, and they're, like, helping, like, reestablish Terran Ferry and, like... Yeah. yeah I see Perrin doing a lot of chopping and building and physical labor stuff to keep his mind occupied. And then Fayil in the background, like, talking to all the wives and all of the wisdoms and all the women's circles in all the different areas. Like, being and there's administration. There's influx of new people and new technology and... Yeah, it's growing. I would also say that they're also having the family planning conversation where they decide no puppies until after the last battle because they <laughs> never talk about that. There's <laughs> never a concern with Fayil getting pregnant. Like this has to be when they're like. I, I wondered if you if you were talking about puppies. Like, <laughs> Listen, Fayil is a lady of the modern age, all right. I bet she was already moon tea man. <laughs> she is a modern woman. I'm say, I'm totally convinced that there is reliable herbal birth control in this world, and I think that they they must they must have decided to not have kids until after the last battle because Perrin never freaks out about a potentially pregnant wife going into danger. Just the wife, not the potentially pregnant part. So, right. I'm I'm just saying, Fael set out to become a hunter. Like she she would have expected some adventure. I can't imagine she like was naive. Not like she wasn't naive to men, right? Right. Though Steph does bring up the... We see her flirting with her. <laughs> Yeah. But Steph brings up a good point in Discord that there is the kids' discussion with her parents in Lord of Chaos. <laughs> of course there is. But <laughs> I-, I think they made their choices before that. Yeah, and, 
And I mean, she she immediately goes to which of my children will inherit which kingdom, basically. <laughs> so it's very much on her mind that she's like starting a dynasty with him. She, but they're young. I think even in their society, there is some time, and I'm pretty sure they would wait until the last battle because everything else would be super. Yeah, seriously. I mean, Elaine is sort of you know working with a limited timeline, so I can understand why she goes for it. But goddamn timing, girl, timing. <laughs> Uh, Elaine also also already was the monarch and she knew that she might get killed and maybe she wanted to get the kids out first. So there'd be succession yeah. established. But and, and I mean, the visual of eight and a half months pregnant Elaine swinging a sword at a trollic from horseback is like, I will accept whatever it takes to make that that situation happen. <laughs> and for having bad family planning decision timing is, is what we need. Then all right, fine. Because <laughs> it's amazing. If that's not a Michelangelo painting, I don't know what right? it is. Right? Yeah. Charging through, like, the clouds and the beast with her sword and her big belly. Yeah. That's all in my head already. Patrick asks if it end, if uh, Zaldea and Numenotheran end up as one nation. I think that they are um, deliberately say that they would have to have at least two kids, so their lines should be split up, clearly, so it doesn't become one nation, because that was one of the things that Elaine didn't want to. Right. She doesn't happened. want Andor getting taken right. over by the two rivers, which is fair. Yeah, so I think I think they have a conversation about that, that they should establish two lines, um, one uh, that the royal line of Sardea and the stewards of the two rivers should not be the same line going forward. I think so. But par- of course, parents are the, um, my kids should marry whoever they want to. <laughs> so... It's like, I can imagine, like, Elaine and Fahir, like, yeah, 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 we're doing the succession, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, uh... Okay. Yeah, because yeah, he's the only one who's, like, not born and bred to power. He doesn't have that right. cultural yeah. background. Poor man. He's like, you marry, you marry to get a bigger farm, duh. Just getting corralled on every side. Well, he's, uh, yeah, he's a steward of the two rivers, I think, is the term. Manetheran, as such, is a dirty word to under... Right, yeah, Manetheran gets put back down... And it's steward of the two rivers as yeah. as the birthplace of the dragon. It's a it's like a nature reserve, but like politically instead of ecologically. Yeah. So conclusion, sort of. Are we there now? So we have this like famous queen in Indian folklore, um, who basically like all the men went to fight and were killed or captured, so only the women were left. And then so all the women went to fight and she had just had her baby. So she had it in a sling um, when she went. So this is exactly what I pictured. Just obviously Elaine with that sword. That's amazing. Well, when you, Thank when you for putting that. I also that. like that she's, that she's wearing pink tiger striped leggings. <laughs> <laughs> of course she is. What else would you wear? That is amazing and wonderful. Is this a historical figure? Yeah. What was her name? I want to look her up. Um, I'm going to... Rani Lakshmi Bai. I'm gonna put that on Discord as well. I like that the baby on her back has a very adult look. <laughs> yeah, I mean the whole perspective in this is interesting. You see the tiny horseman underneath the horse. Mm-hmm. Weird. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How how quickly did that kid have to grow up? Eh? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you yeah. think that you shouldn't maybe shake newborn, so having it on a galloping horse is maybe. <laughs> That's a whole different version of shaking baby syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a choice between this and dying. Well, right. Yeah, that's, there's a really good point where Elaine is like, it doesn't matter. Even if I like the whole like vision of men being like, oh, you'll be safe. She's like, it doesn't matter if I had that vision or not. Because at this point, the world ends if I don't win this battle. So it literally mm-hmm. doesn't matter if I'm endangering my babies because I'm endangering them no matter what. The world is in danger. And as I said... She thinks that even if she dies, if she is babies, then her kingdom has a queen and that's what she needs. Of course, that she might have a, a boy does not enter her mind because... No. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's like, clearly the queen of Andor always has a girl. Duh. There's right. probably like a special, you know, like how to make sure that your baby comes out as a girl sort of like handbook in the queen's apartments. <laughs> those are things... So yeah, those are things that I wondered about, like stuff in the White Tower and just in general in the book series, because it's never talked about in fantasy series really ever. But, like, how do these women control their periods oh every God. How do these women control not getting pregnant? You know, like, the green, especially, the green ajas, especially with their many warders. Like, obviously, they probably have some sort of channeling powers that they use for that. But I would have liked a little bit of detail on that, to be honest. Because it's just a whole different world that 
never gets acknowledged I mean, and it's a part yeah. of life you know the the whole you just need to drink this tea and you'll not get pregnant as a fantasy trope that i would love to be yeah. correct right a, t a tea how you, easy i don't have to i don't have to <laughs> insert like personality changing hormones into my body that's nice depression pills um, not necessary mm -hmm. how amazing <laughs> mm -hmm. Ugh. yeah yeah right Fan i don't know it's just a bunch of stuff that you know you throw tea at it and there there's your solution well i kind of want to know more to be fair they don't really go to the toilet as well so why should they this talk is true about bodily fluids don't periods. happen in the wheel of time no ah, no elaine makes water <laughs> only when she's pregnant though <laughs> only when she's pregnant right right elaine it, right 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 it get mentioned gets mentioned that elaine and bergidi bergida uh sync up once they are right pregnant. which is just yeah so there are periods yeah, happening. It, it feels which you'd never know until that point or know again until after that point they probably <laughs> have like again naive has like super absorbent mosses or something they put in their underwear or something yeah, something, something. RJ was a man, right? Who knows? From a man's perspective, for a male audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, product of and its again, time. And again, nobody has to use the bathroom all the time, so these details, yeah. obviously, fall by the wayside. I, I love it too, Bambi, because it's something that I definitely notice. I don't, I don't give him a, I don't give him a patriarchy eyebrow for this. I feel like Bambi, we couldn't be into Wheel of Time if we didn't love crunchy detail. We wouldn't be doing this episode if we didn't love. Crunchy detail, yeah. Like, I know so many, exactly. I know so many people who like stopped reading after book three, four, five, six, whichever one it was, but they couldn't get through because he gets more and more granular as the books <laughs> go on. Yeah, I really, I really can't understand that. I mean, I can understand not getting into it, like not finishing Eye of the World or After Eye of the World. But if you've already read like five books or something, how can you write? I know. I mean, I just, I wish Don't he had you taken need all to his. Know how this turns out yeah i don't get this i do wish that he could have taken his you know stance on detailing dresses and use that into like oh now you couldn't channel today because her block was her cramps or something you know like <laughs> that would have been so awesome <laughs> or any of them like yeah i don't know there's a lot of ways that could have been spun to be more entertaining but that's that's just me maybe that's why she was so angry bambi <laughs> she just like had pcos that was her real block was just like chronic pcos it's cramping hard. <laughs> I have sits all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true, Seth. Seth says maybe you don't want to do writing about PMS. Well, Harriet yeah. would have had a bit of influence, right? Like, that's what she was there for. But yeah, that's true. Maybe that would have been entertaining, too, seeing a guy take a stab at it. Yeah, seriously. Do your research, <laughs> bro. No, no. <laughs> you live with a woman and marry one. Like, it's... There is a whole subreddit. Half of the world deals with it. There's, there's no excuse to not know about it. No, it's true, but there's a whole subreddit for men writing women, and they re like really make fun of how women are sometimes described. And this is just like she normal. She pressed the down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> these, these are just normal descriptions. We're not even talking about periods or stuff which you know they like don't see, which is a lot of the times behind the scene. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I ideally. Don't... <laughs> ideally. <laughs> Excellent, Sapphire. We went from parent to period. <laughs> As you do. There's so many parallels I'm drawing with that in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Women just, just break their heels of stilettos and can run. Yeah. Nobody would do that. You'd maybe throw your shoes away and then get splinters in your toes. But a broken off heel does not help. No. Or just running into heels because that's <laughs> totally a thing is totally feasible i would never break anyone's ankles or did you guys no. see that uh that one clip of the new oh my god <laughs> oh no baby what? so the the chick from um the joker Har with the big harley blonde quinn? pigtails harley quinn yeah her movie that just came out the scene where birds she gives her prey. ponytail holder to birds the other prey? yeah birds of prey she gives her ponytail holder to the other chick actress like in the film and that was such a revolutionary thing because you always see women just fighting with their hair loose and that would never happen in a real scenario because your hair being in your face is a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> it would also look awful afterwards. Oh, yeah. It'd get caught in stuff. People would pull your hair and use it against you. Like, there's all kinds of things that are involved with that you, that you just don't really think so. That's that's the thing. I know I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm totally aware that wrestling isn't real. But still, all these guys with the long hair and they try to pin each other to the mat. Why don't you just, just step on the guy's hair? Nobody will move if you step on their hair. Right. It's it's the most effective thing ever. Yeah. That's so you just stand there. 
That's so painful even to think. <laughs> I knew really? a guy in uh, <laughs> high school who had a bald spot on the back of his head. He was a senior in high school and he had a bald spot from a his hair was caught like someone stepped on it and something happened he had a chunk of hair ripped out so intensely that he had a bald spot that had not grown back in and he was this like big dude with like a proper beard and then he had this like accident induced bald spot so he always got cast as like old guys in the drama department because like he was big tall had a beard and had a bald spot like a little bit of gray uh you know hair spray and poof he's like the old guy while all of us other you know high schoolers are running around pretending to be adults (laughs) but yeah i just yeah visceral pain visceral pain yeah right we have actually gotten to the end of my notes Whew. and two hours and 31 minutes of recording <laughs> man holy shit i mean if i could talk to you guys forever i probably would though so there is that <laughs> two hours feels oh like yeah nothing. yeah yeah anna what time what are do- you at now um it's a quarter to 11 mm. that's early for you I'm fine <laughs> my husband has gotten home from work and uh looked into the room and went back went back out again and probably went to bed already so <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, this is this has been such a nice like reprise of like the I, spoiler con energy. I don't care how long we go. I probably I probably yeah. go right right into the the stump afterwards because I'm pumped <laughs> right now to discuss stuff. And then I I never even got into my controversial wheel of time opinion. Yes, we did get there. Maybe another episode. I, I won't go there in public. We should People do a will. stump in our on that actually. So then everyone People will assassinate me on that. Oh, on your on mine, yeah. Do we want to talk about anything spoiler con related or should we? Steph wants us to do a woman's opinion on Nynaeve and Valenluca. I think she likes to flirt. She's in love with Ra- with Lan. She likes to flirt. She likes being seen as a sexual person for the first time in her life. That's all I got to yeah, say. I think about she likes that. being flirted with because he's cute and he lays on the flattery real good. But I also right. really don't honestly right. qualify for understanding that relationship because I don't get flirting. So. Oh, I do. I, I flirt all the time. I think everybody who met me knows that I flirt all the time. It's fun. Yeah, I think it's super new for her. It's super fun. He, he fl- flatters her so much. He sees her. He has he has no idea that she's either a wise one or, uh, no, um, what's it called? Wisdom or, like, important in any way. She just sees her as a woman and uh, thinks she's mm-hmm. really hot. It's new for her. It's fun. She would never have stayed there. She would have gone insane with this guy. Oh, he's annoying as shit. He drives me crazy. He's like that local that comes into the bar when you're working and just sits at the bar by himself to talk only to you and tries to bother you while you're trying to do your job. Like, I feel like that's what he's doing with (laughs) Nynaeve. Exactly. Just constantly trying to talk to her and flatter her and compliment her and talk about the most random shit just to get her attention. And yeah, maybe it's flattering for a bit, but at the end of the day, it's just annoying, dude. It's, cool it totally jet. depends. It totally depends on your mood. Like there are days where this is really nice. Please go on. And there are days of come on, no, 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 dude. I'm just trying to live here. Yeah, <laughs> I <laughs> live. Yeah, just just existing. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's definitely nice to be reminded that you're a female and that you're attractive. Right. For sure, everybody enjoys that every now and again. But he right. was just over the and top. And it was all in aim of his bloody show. <laughs> yeah. And I, like I get what Steph is saying. Like you don't get the feeling that she likes it, but. She does keep going back for more. I feel like she would have been way more harsher to shut him down if she hadn't wanted it. And I think this is the Matt syndrome where, you know, she's thinking, she's not showing it. She's not thinking it even, or or she's thinking something different, but doing something different. Like, I really, I, I think she enjoyed it, honestly. Yeah. yeah, and she also got more and more comfortable in her body and in her being nice looking, which mm-hmm. ha- probably has to do with the compliments she's getting. Like she, she doesn't think about I want to good look for this uh, to look good for this dude. She thinks I want to look good for Lan, who's not there. So, so she does want to look good for herself, and this is nice. It kind of teaches her that, yeah, right. So that you are allowed to look good just for you, not for any other purpose. Right, right. and that brings up a good like I that makes me think that she fights so hard in the two rivers to be seen as older than she is, not prettier, not more beautiful, not. Like, she needs to be seen as the wisdom. So she needs to be practical. She needs to be, like, you know, like, I don't know if that's shown as much, but you know how men don't take pretty men, pretty women seriously, so she she can't go down that road Yeah. in yeah. the two rivers. And then suddenly she's out in the world, and 
and there's this Luca guy who's like not only seeing her as pretty but also respects her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's more that she's not comfortable with enjoying the flirting. Like that's more maybe where her discomfort is coming from. Is she's like, this is new and I like it, and I don't know how I feel about the fact that I like it. Mm-hmm. And I think I don't think that she likes it all right. the time. No, right? I it's agree. like a new experience, which is which is normal, which is absolutely normal. Totally her and the silk dress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. She she takes a while to change her opinions about her opinions, if that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to put and it. And if you tell her that she did, she oh, yeah. will reject this. How dare you tell me I'm evolving? Her, <laughs> her, this, this dress is green moment it would be her, this dress is green. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like this wool dress. Yeah. Did you guys in the Discord no have any other that, questions um, or anything? Yeah. Or points yes. that you think we missed or should yeah, talk about? That was a about? good good little tangent. Thank you, Steph. Yeah. SpoilerCon news is that SpoilerCon is awesome and there will be more news about it. You, you yeah. should want to come. We are, <laughs> sign up for the newsletter. SpoilerCon, the, 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 the principle of a SpoilerCon is something awesome and yeah, who knows. Yeah, we, uh, we want to encourage everybody to sign up for the newsletter so that you can stay updated on if there are any changes in the next coming months. Otherwise... Go to the website, spoilercon.org, and you can find all the current information there, basically. Yeah. That's all we can really talk about right now with everything yeah, that's going on. Yeah, but these, you know, we all actually physically got to hang out in person and talk Wheel of Time for, like, two and a half straight days, and it was the goddamn best. It was so amazing. So. It was such a whirlwind of, like, meeting people for the first time that you had been talking to for months online. You know, it's such a, it's such a surreal feeling. Of putting faces to Discord names. Adjusting to voices instead <laughs> you know? of emoji strategies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kind of liked it too. I actually had very few Wheel of Time related conversations. <laughs> I had a lot of conversations, but very few Wheel of Time ones. And they were all... That's amazing. actually really true. Like, so We talk Wheel of Time on Discord all the time. We got together and talked about our real lives. Because like, yeah, then you and I, like, we talked like nonstop on that walk. <laughs> yep. Exactly. And that was all about life. I don't remember half of it. It was, exactly. I don't remember half of what we discussed. It feels like such an eon ago. But, yeah. Um, I don't think it was about real life. No, I remember a long talk about how you grew up with not free public libraries. That's the the thing I really strongly yes. remember. It was like, <laughs> your library cost money? What? <laughs> yeah. There's a really cool little powwow we had one night, too, where we all talked about how the books came into our lives and how we all discovered the books and what they meant to us. It's just really cool bonding moments throughout the weekend that looking forward oh, that to was, new that people. was so great when we did uh, go around the people sitting down yeah. on the floor and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, this, 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 uh, this walk through the woods there, that was a tangent episode all of itself. I think you, Aradia, <laughs> you and I, we actually talked about the different width of yes! railway rails at some point. <laughs> Why? I have no idea. Yeah, we walked over those little really <laughs> narrow ones and we got on a whole tangent about the history of railroad grades. Because, yeah. as you do. Yeah, as of you course. Do. Yeah. And I tried to, po- I remember trying to point out all of the mountains and stuff, but it was raining way too hard to see like across Portland, much less to all the cascades. Yeah. So I was like, over there is a volcano. But and we over could there see is a the volcano. Trees. We could just, we could see the trees. So our Ogier did his job. I mean, I feel like that's the kind of thing you you have to be there to understand how awesome it was. Like we can wax poetic all afternoon, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. or night, oh. all, all the way around the world for a whole twenty four hours, just passing the baton, <laughs> talking about how awesome Spoiler Gun was. Well, Seth wants to know what they did wrong. Um, oh, <laughs> you think we listened to you? <laughs> what did they get wrong about what? <laughs> Seth, who said? I don't know anything. <laughs> I guess everything. I mean, do you want to be more specific? Um... <laughs> I mean, yeah. Every episode, there's like one tiny thing or another where I think, eh. But then, who cares? Nothing. I don't know. It's just it's one of those things where, like, even if you get stuff wrong, who's to say what's right or wrong? This is your interpretation of what you're reading sentence by sentence, and I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, so I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that Nicola is not super super strong as a power, but she has those talents which make her special. Mm. Oh, I okay. Yeah, I get it. What did you get wrong in this book? I think that's what he's asking. When he, when Patrick was in, introduced, well, when he was like uh, plugging our show last time, last live recording, he said that we'll discuss things they got wrong. Oh. And, 
and I think that's what yeah, they I, look. I honestly mm. don't know. I did not take notes on that. Yeah, I... <laughs> if I'd known, if I'd known like three months ago you'd do this, <laughs> then I'd have another d Google Doc. <laughs> that could be the tagline for this whole series. The fuck ups were needed. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. 